this historic meeting of the Henderson County Board of Elections to conduct a hearing on challenges is now called to order. I want to commend you and the audience for your efforts, your interest, and uh, we're just proud of you and we're here, here to participate in always improving the quality of our voter registrations. Um, I know there were some latecomers here. Please do sign in and let that paper circulate. And in particular, uh, in a minute I'll describe the process, but if you know of or are a person being challenged, good heavens, raise your hand and come forward. You'll be sworn in and, and we'll deal with the uh, data at that time. I'd like to introduce my fellow board members. To my left is Tom Wilson, who's been on the board for, what, 16 years or so? Seems like 100. He was our immediate past chairman and did an exemplary job for many, many years. To my right is Debbie Dante, who's new to the board and uh, brings that kind of uh, unique insight that a new member always brings. And we can't help uh, but uh, re remember the memory of Betty Gash, who left the board after 14 loyal years. Any more stand up? The mic is not uh, on a loudspeaker. The mic goes to that camera, and I'm going to ask that you settle down and listen as carefully as you can. I will enunciate as clearly as I can. So if you have hearing problems, maybe move forward and let's get that over with or turn up your hearing aids, but we'll do the best we can. Okay? Now, um, I'd like to turn to our director, Beverly Cunningham, who's also been in service for a long time and past president of the Directors Association and has an outstanding reputation across the state to introduce her staff members who are present tonight. I'm Beverly Cunningham, and with us today is Cliff Moore, who's our election specialist, and Karen Hitt, the deputy director in the office. And we're glad to answer any questions you have outside of this meeting after the meeting's over today or future. Thank you. That brings up a point. I have some questionnaires or forms, whatever they are, and we'll not be hearing a lot of uh, speeches tonight, but we are interested in your feedback. So after the meeting, we'll make sure you have available this form to you individually, and you can write your questions, your comments, rate the meeting, and give us your feedback and contact information, and every question will be answered. Now, the purpose of the hearing, and I want to read this, is to determine if there are any voter registrants that were challenged and sustained at the August 20th meeting, if they're here tonight to offer any sworn testimony as to why they should not be removed. What I will do by each of the four challengers who presented information in the same order as last uh, August 20th, I'll read off the names and look to see if a hand goes up if that challenger is here. If that challenger is here, we want them to come forward at that time, be sworn in, and we'll hear their story. I will now start. The first group was of uh, challengers were brought to us by Michael Eberhardt. Raise your hand. And I'm going to read the first name and get started. Whitney Boyd. Christopher Edwards. Shirley D. Howard. Joaquin Izquierdo. Pauline Lauter, or Laughter. Krista Lentz, L-E-N-T-Z. Juanita K.D. Mauer, M-A-W-Y-E-R. Douglas Mosar. Linda Susan Myers, David Olmsted, Kathleen Linda Olmsted, Anne Marie Rivers, Betty Jo Saxton, Edward A. Seelan, S C L A N, Teresa Rose Skenzel. 
and Karen Urban. In that there are no challengers here, are there any comments by staff on any of the names read? Is there a motion from a board member that uh, we accept the challenge? So moved. And agreed. These challenges have been accepted. The next process will be that our director will, or, will write what are called orders. They go out to each of these members, copies to what the political party heads and the persons who brought the challenges. And those individuals, because remember, our overall goal is to assure that every person who has a right to vote gets that right to vote. And those that shouldn't will be removed from the voting rules. All right, the next group is brought to us by Glenn Engelram, and I'm going to break it in two parts. The first part were the three challengers he brought, and I'll read their names. David Clifford Cree, C-R-E-E. -E. Gretchen Lee Cree. Sherry Lynn Landgraf. Seeing that none of them are here, I'll ask the board, are, are there any comments by staff? Is there a motion by a board member? Second. Second, third. These challenges are accepted. The other group brought by Mr. Lingeram, I will now read. Karen L. Beck. Melissa Diane Cookus. Virginia Marie Eads, E-A-D-S. Leon Marie Fisher. K. K. Ford, Daniel Lee Frazier, Montana Sue Frazier, Pat Mattern, Betsy Mayhew, Willavine McCall, Alexis A. McCulloch, Ann Moore, Ronnie Mitchell Riddle, Denise Mary Torres, Sandra Johnson Whiteside, Irene Wickenhaus, Joseph Leonard Wimmer. Does staff have any comments on any of the names read? Is there a motion by the board? So moved. These challenges are here. I will make the comment that we did find evidence of some people, like one of these people still has a residence here, uh, but they're obviously been in a nursing facility, so they're not receiving mail at that address. Also, uh, there will be several that probably appeared before us at one time as a removal but because the birth dates did not match, we by law can't remove them. And so we know of some of these circumstances, but uh, there's nothing we can do otherwise. But we won't go through those individually. All right, the next is a group of challenges brought by Judy Evans. I'll read their names. Ray Doyle Eads, Christopher Kelly Franklin, Warren Roy Grindall, Her uh, Carl Harold Holmstrom, Kelly Lynn Murphy, <laughs> Jessica Susan Patron, Gregory Clifford Poulton, P-O-U-L-T-O-N, Gary Wayne Reed, Nancy Grace Stahl, Mark Morgan Tracy, George Henry Voigt, V-O-G-T, second group brought by Ms. Evans, Joseph John Agostini, Mary Bradley, Patrick Caven Brown, William Cleveland, Charles Justin Coleman, Neil P. Conley, Earl Connor, 
Cody Anthony Curry, Grant Earl Darbyson, Dorothy Marie Ebbins, Ellen Ann Harbo, Tiffany Marie Harris, James O. Helton, H-E-L-T-O-N, Ernestine Henderson, Guy Henderson, Allison Rhett Hundley, Deborah Williams Hutchinson, Ricky Lloyd Hutchinson, John Lewis Kennedy, Olfa Lee Medling, Donald Edward Meyer, Curtis Darrell Mitchell, James Morey, M-O-E-R-Y, Barbara Nelson, Janice Marie Paquette, P-A-Q-U-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E. Megan Lee Parker, Hollis Peterson, Mary Elizabeth Reagan, R-E-A-G-A-N, Gladys W. Smith, Donald Reynolds Wardlaw, William Preston Westbrook, Eunice Lauder Williams, Gary James Williams. Does staff have any comments about any of these names? First challenge on the second group? No. Oh, the second group. Okay, I'm there. Go ahead. So this was a person who voted in 2012. Um, in doing research, we noticed that he had purchased property in the county uh, in April, April 17th of this year uh, at 10 Gray Wolf Lane. Uh, so there's, if you remove him when he shows up to vote, he will have to vote provisionally. He will be allowed to vote. It will be a provisional ballot. Has any attempt by staff been made to contact him at 10 Gray Wolf Lane? No. It may be prudent for uh, Ms. Evans to contact him at that address if you can and urge him to come in and update his records. Okay? I don't think that's her responsibility. Well, it may not she be. She may not want to it assume may. that responsibility. I don't think that's her responsibility. Well, I have no idea where Gray Wolf Lane is, but it might not be in the same precinct, so he could very well be voting in a different precinct than the one in which he's registered currently. If that's not allowed by law. What? That's not allowed. So if he came, if he went to the law precinct, he would not be allowed. Well, but he can vote provisionally. He has to go to his, he has to go to his proper precinct. Yeah. Have to go to his new All right. I think we'd agree with Tom's assessment. I don't see that as our job to, to find out where he is. We've just reported what our canvas and letter campaign discovered. And if he's relocated, I think that's the Board of Election responsibility to track him down. It's not a responsibility no. of the Board of Elections. That's, we don't track down voters. It's if his responsibility to come us, in. If the Board directs us in this particular case to try to contact him, we'll be glad to. Well, let's see how many of those cases we have. You've got a good burden on you already. Just one. Is there any other comment? There's one of this. This is the only case of this nature. Well, all right. It's theoretically, it's actually up to that voter to take responsibility. Let's discuss that among the board here. Yeah, we'll go ahead. what we want to do. All right. You have a recommendation? No, thanks. You? I wouldn't be opposed to the board, um, to the, to the, a board of Elections contacting him at Gray Wolf. What's it's kind of out of the ordinary. It's not a yeah. normal course of it's, a, it's an extra step. What's your view, Tom? I think we need to be consistent on what we do. 
-hmm. So we, we've already brought this forward. There's nobody come forward for Agostinia. I think we need to follow through on the challenge. Mm -hmm. And then if uh, he shows up to vote, he's just going to have to go through the process. Any of these voters, if they show up to vote, can vote. Correct. They will never be denied if they show up to vote. Correct. It's a, the provisional process they have to go through. It's a lot of paperwork for them and then a lot of paperwork on our end. But they will not be denied the right to vote. I That's believe, if I remember right, that they have to go Sir, through. you need, uh, this is a discussion between us, not the we're not, not open, we're not open for public comment, so exactly. we need to keep this among the three of us as to okay. what we're going to do. I mean, that's my thinking. The, uh, to be consistent on what we're doing, I think we need to go ahead and sustain this challenge. And that's the only one we had a question on all the other names been read. Correct. I yeah. move that's that fine. we go forward with the challenge. Second. All right, I'll agree with that. All right, we have one more batch. So do we have a motion then? We, 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 we just go ahead with the challenge. That's what we agreed to. And then, okay, and then you second to remove all. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next is uh, a group brought by Ed Joran. Okay. I'll now read those names. Joseph Anthony Brock, Lara Margaret Campion, John Henry Cowden, Craig Richard Davis. Donald Hubert Ellingberg, Dovi Ora Faust, Timothy Allen Fowler, Harold Eugene Gallagher, Oscar Gonzalez, Denise Carol Geschlecht, Brittany May Gulick, Lisa M. Helms, Ruth Lunsford, Lunsford Henderson. That's Lu Ruth Lunsford Henderson. Mary Catherine Hooper. Michael William Illiff. Delphia D. Jones. Taher Hassan Kapasi. Matthew Robert Kaufman. Virginia May Kick. Jean Gertrude Kiefer. Nancy Odom Kimsey. Joseph, Joseph Anthony Lahoud. Harleen Lowe. Lee, Virginia M. Lee, Joetta Van Dyke Looney, John Andrew McGraw, Sarah Brotherton Murphy, Violet Square Myers, Laura Elizabeth Nehis, Shannon Lance Newman. Sarah Renona Owens. Merlin Van Phillips. Ruth S. Riley. Jeffrey Richard Roberts, Sr. Patricia Lynn Santelli, Madeline Overland Schaefe, Peter Hamill Shelton, Clarence Johnny Sumi, Kathy Louise Watson, Lillian Lucille Wilcox. Does the staff have any comments on any of these names? Okay, it's on page two. Go ahead. Sir, um, in response to the letter we said, we received a call from the voter's daughter uh, who said that her mother, Virginia Kick, is still at that residence. And um, through the conversation, we discovered that apartment 211 was missing from her address information, so the mail did not get there for that reason. They 
they submitted, or should the voters submitted a new registration form correcting the address and updating it to apartment 211 at 333 Thompson Street, the address of the letter? I assume from what you say that that challenge should be dismissed then. I'm asking the board. Yeah, no, the same nature. Yes, any others, any others are the same nature? Yes, we have one more case of, of exactly the same nature and the same residence mm -hmm. address. This is Laura Elizabeth Nels, N-E-H-L-S. Uh, again, a uh, child called in response to the challenge letter, uh, and we sent a registration form to the voter to update the correct address. Again, missing the apartment number, in this case, 405. Uh, we have received the corrected information and we have updated that in our system. I move that we, with the exception of those two names that have been mentioned, Kick and Nails, uphold the challenge and remove those voters. Okay. A second. Agreed. Okay, do you understand? Okay, good. Um, that takes care of those four groups. Now, let's see what else we've got here. Okay, the director uh, will uh, be preparing orders in the next few days to be mailed to the removed voters, the party chairs, and the challengers. So that's one more step that is required in case we miss somebody and they're really able to vote. This concludes the hearing portion of this meeting. I want to thank you all for coming. The board will now go into its own meeting, and you're welcome to stay if you'd like to. Um, but I want to pause long enough to pass out or give you these forms so you can ah, send us any comments or questions, and then we will simply call this hearing adjourned and go into our regular short board It's 5 o'clock and it's official start time. And people will turn off their cell phones and take their seats, please. There is, as usual, a procedure to be followed. And the first one is for my fellow board members to look at and, and approve the agenda or not approve it. Do we have a motion? Okay. Can you second this? Yes. Yes. All right, the motion, the uh, agenda is approved. Um, the main subject on the table is challenges, and uh, there are some things I need to read, if you'll bear with me. Some of these were the same things I read at the last hearing, and the state has asked us to make sure it's in the record. So here I go. The purpose of the hearing is to determine if the challenges presented meet the criteria required by Chapter 163-85 of the NC General Statutes, which cover, quote, challenge procedure other than on day of primary or election, end quote, and to determine next step for each challenge. I'm asked to also read Statute 163-90.1, Burden of Proof. A, challenges shall not be made indiscriminately and may only be made if the challenger knows, suspects, or reasonably believes such a person not to be qualified and entitled to vote. B, no challenge shall be sustained until the challenge is substantiated by affirmative proof in the absence of such proof, the presumption shall be that the voter is properly registered or affiliated. I'm now reading 163-90.3, making false affidavit perjury. Any person who shall knowingly make any false affidavit or shall knowingly swear or affirm falsely to any matter or thing required by the terms of this article to be sworn or affirmed shall be guilty of a class I felony. We used to think that was class one, but it's class I. It's the 10th and lowest ranking of all the felonies in North Carolina. Now further, the state has been properly and uh, appreciatively 
looking at our progress on these kinds of hearings. It's one of the few going on in the state, I guess. And they brought forward two items. We have to decide whether or not these are timely challenges and whether they should be dismissed or allowed to be heard as part of the preliminary hearing. Now, in that regard, I note that the uh, South Mill River challenges brought by Mr. Duran initially have a date of April 14th, 2019. And this is getting to be four and five months late, and that's a worry to us. So I think one thing we'd like to learn before trying to render a judgment is what has taken so long for this to arrive on the top of our desk? Do you have any comments? I'll defer to Mr. Ingram for that. You the challenger. You're the challenger. You're the challenger. Okay. Just that, that the processing of the paperwork took that long. I was not involved in that part of the process. So okay. I can just tell you that. I got you. It should have been quicker, in my yeah. opinion. Ms. Bev, do you happen to recall when that body of challenges came to your office? Uh, two days ago, three days ago, two days ago. Yesterday. This is uh, Evans delivered to Mr. Duran on the 23rd of the Robbers. Well, all right. Two days. How do we learn why it took so long in more detail so we can try and set a, a, a limit on this? Time delay. You're not allowing me to speak. He's the challenger. But I have an answer to the question. Yeah. So you're you're you're. I will allow you to speak if you have the answer. Go ahead. Okay. I I will give my time to Mr. Engelman. I mean, as, as, as Ed has said, there's a there's a all of this work is done by volunteers. All of this work required taking the time to first of all ascertain with the canvassing whether or not we had reason to send the letter that the law requires. And then, as you all are aware, I believe every one of these challenges that we're entertaining now are the result of the initial attempts to challenge when you all dismissed the challenges for lack of a second mailing. So we had to give ourselves the time to send those second letters and to have them come back. And I would argue or, or raise the question, isn't isn't the real question whether or not the evidence that was obtained earlier in the year as to whether or not a voter lives at a particular address, is that still the case when you go into the North Carolina Board of Election records? And the answer is every one of the challenges you're going to see from this point forward have been vetted in that fashion. So Recently? that what you're, what, what you're getting, it, well, today. So if you're getting data today that has a date I'm submitting 10 challenges today that are dated back in July, okay? Um, and, and I fully respect that it's taken, you know, from now until then, but as I've already explained, some of these were signed without the benefit of the second letter. So it's, it's reasonable to ask why now, but I think the real question that, that is at the, at, the, at the forefront of your decision is, is the data we're presenting square with the Board of Election Records vis-a-vis -vis having staff here to go check? And the answer is it does. It does not. Can we address that? Please. What website do you use to check this information? North Carolina State Board of Election has a voter lookup site. And when you go there, you can type in the name of the individual. And in every case, it opens up access to the voter record, where the person is registered in terms of the address, what their status is, active or inactive, what their voter history is. my fellow board members if they have thoughts or questions. I have some questions, but I'd, I'd rather wait until the challenger okay. presents the information. All right. Debbie, do you have any questions? Okay, so we're just talking about this first paragraph here about yes. the, the dates. Yeah. I, don't I guess the question uh, is, how, is there a way to shorten this time between data collection and the hearings? Well, I understand what his response was that they were submitted on that date but then turned back because it wasn't sent to the mailing address. 
So that's why the dates mm -hmm. on the affidavits are what, four okay. months ago. And we have an, an unresolved. But he's checked the information lately, and it's current, so I sh shouldn't see a problem with um, with that affidavit. Okay, and you'd like to reserve thoughts until we get into the cases, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how we can settle the answer on what we know right now. She just down. Go ahead and set a time frame that you expect those notices to be dated when they're filed. The last thing that you should be done would be the signature of the notice challenge after they've done the research. That's a... That's right, but you know because they sent it to the wrong address, that's why it's dated four months ago. So that probably won't come up again. That probably won't happen again. No, that's, these are new notices of challenges. These are totally new. Okay, so they're not the they're P.O. Not box. box. Yes. No. Okay. So they should have been one repeat. Uh, yeah, okay. Four months ago. Well, let yeah, me ask the director. Let me ask the director a question. You say within a couple of weeks, if we were to say 30 days, would that be reasonable? And I, yeah. I agree with all that, but it's prudent for the board to set their dates based on the best knowledge we can. And what I'm hearing is that you think two weeks ought to be enough, and if we're lenient and go for 30 days, that ought to cover it, as far as we know now. <laughs> All right, but Tom would like to comment later when we get into it, so let's tentatively say 30 days. Well, where, where are we being charged with being able to change the law and say, well, we won't accept any affidavits over 30 days old? Anytime you have a quasi-judicial hearing, this board sets the policy. There is nothing standard in the law that says six months, three months. That's right. why the state's saying this board set the policy. Come out clean up the so has... Has any other board in the state come to this? Well, the state would know, right? And you've talked to the state? If they knew, uh, they might have told us, and they didn't. Yeah. Well, I'd be interested to know, coming from the state, if any other county has set deadlines on dates on affidavits. I'd like to know where, I'm just kind of interested where it's coming from. Well, uh, this can be modified if we have new information at a later time. But for now, we're tentatively saying 30 days, but that is subject to further discussion yet this evening. Agreed? Let me go on. Um, the question related to this is whether or not the challenger or other challengers have recently investigated and researched the information before filing the changes with a concern as to whether or not these filings are being done indiscriminately, not all or some. That's, that's a concern we're hearing. That's a legitimate concern. And furthermore, uh, this decision needs to be made tonight, so we're going to revisit it. Now, to any of either my board members or the staff, are we able to move on, or is there anything else you want to say at this time on this subject? Hearing not, um, let me go down the list of our procedural guide. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you citizens for caring. We're, we're collaborating here in trying to uh, prudently make the registry of voters as, as accurate, up-to-date as possible. And we're all, in a sense, struggling to do that the best way we know how. I appreciate that. It's sometimes I think you lose sight of that. Yeah, I know. You can get into it and wonder. Now, at this time, may I please introduce the uh, board and then ask the director to introduce the staff, even though you've heard this before. To my left is Tom Wilson, who has been a longtime board member and chairman and whose continued uh, presence in council is invaluable and appreciated. To my right is Debbie. Dante, who has a paralegal background, as you can see, and she brings the value of fresh insight and questions, and we welcome her. Director Bev, will you introduce the staff, and I introduce you as Beverly Cunningham, the director of the finest board of elections in the 
100 counties in the state of North Carolina. All right, thank you. Um, I have read the 163 statutes, and we're now ready to move forward with the actual challenges. Now, the first uh, situation is from um, Mrs. Judith Evans, and she had to be out of town, so her challenges uh, can't be presented by her tonight. And our issue is, do we dismiss them or do we continue them to some later date? Is there a recommendation? What does the law say? And there is no precedent as far as I know uh, from what the state board said. It was a decision based that this board would make, just like any other, any other decision in regards to the challenges. Any comments, questions? Um, yeah, I thought that, correct me if I'm wrong, the statute says that the challenger has to be present. Yes, right. Right. Um, so my next question is that when she dropped them off on Tuesday and you immediately called and tried to figure out a Thursday as, as the hearing date, did she not tell you she wasn't going to be in town to, to do these? I immediately called her after I set the meeting up with mm -hmm. the board. She did not answer her phone on Tuesday afternoon. And she called me Wednesday morning sometime. And she had my fact she told me she was leaving in 30 minutes. She could not be here today. So she came in a couple hours later and brought that to the continuous letter. Oh, okay. Is that, do we have that? Yes. Yeah. Now, our, uh, Tom, did you have something you want to say at this time? Um, we're going to have more challenges presented prior to the this October 10th date. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know exactly what our plans will be, but I would be in favor of giving her a continuance, providing she is at the next scheduled hearing. If she doesn't show at that time, I think we need to dismiss all challenges. A second. And I agree with that. I think that's fair treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means that we are caring about the citizen input to clean up the voting records, and yet we've got to, you know, act. Uh, I think later we will deal with the next uh, uh, preliminary hearing. And um, Bev, did you have some dates in mind? Um, the last day to file challenges would be October the 10th, because that's 25 days before the election. So my suggestion, rather than having a piecemeal hearing here and there, that we have all remaining preliminary hearings after that day and schedule any preliminary hearing on any challenge that's filed on October 15th at 2 o'clock here. That way, that would give everybody a chance to schedule a little over two weeks and they can raise their schedules. that convenient or possible? I'm looking. October 15th? Right. It's a Wednesday. Yeah, it's right here at 10 and 6, so 2 is... Yeah. Um, so normally we have our meetings at five. Is there a reason that you're yeah. wanting to do it in the middle of the Because I have to take the day off of work is why I'm asking. We have training at 10 and 6. That's the reason. That's what we're trying to work on. It we, is. Of course, we have an election. We have training all that week, three nights. So. Right. Oh, okay, I see. So you couldn't, get, you couldn't squeeze it in at the night because of the training. Right. right. I gotcha. And then the next week we're going to be voting in this room, so. So, so October 15th? No, um, yes. yes. At 2 o'clock. And, uh, yes. I mean, that's. If that can work out. In the future, it works better for me at 5 because I, I do. Understood. Better, I'll take the day off. Give All us right. that schedule again, please, Bill. The October 15th. Just the dates that you were talking about. Uh, well, October 10th is the last day of five challenges. That's a Friday. So, of course, the 11th and 12th will be out. If the challenges are filed on the 10th, we have to have time to do our research. And we have, uh, that entire week is filled up. Monday's the only day, so we'd have to do the research on Monday because we have training on Tuesday also and then have a hearing on Wednesday at 2. What's the date? 15th. 
15th, a Wednesday at 2 o'clock. That's preliminary hearings. That's preliminary hearings. All preliminary hearings, including the continuance. That would be all preliminary hearings. And then we would have the full hearings on the 29th at a time and a place to be determined. It will not be here because we'll be doing our one-stop voting here. And, um, we had hoped to have it earlier in the day because we're voting until 8 o'clock that night, and I need to be here. Yeah. How are you on the 29th at 10 a.m.? Um, let me just throw this in the mix. Since you all are so busy with the election coming up, can we just postpone this till? Yeah. Okay. Law says can be heard before the election if they're filed by the 10th. If they're filed 25 oh. days in advance. Okay. How discombobulated? Because it would be easier for the staff well, we to do it after. Well, can you do the 29th at 10 in the morning? October. Correct. Well, I can't. I mean, that was another day off. Do you work five days a week? Yeah, I'm five days now. Yeah. Uh, would nine o'clock be better than you be late for work? Could you do that? Mm -hmm. That would be better. Yeah, because I could do it an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. Set a time that's convenient for you, and then Debbie can make that at nine o'clock. I mean, that's fine. Agreed. Okay, so October. I don't know where it's going to be. It's like nine o'clock. Okay, All right, so 9 o'clock. 10, 29. 9 a.m. The location to be determined because we can't do it here. I'll make a motion that we accept the director's recommendations on this hearing as of the October 10th and subsequent dates for finalizing these challenges. I'll have a second. And I agree. That's accomplished. All right. So we have continued um, uh, the cases of uh, Judith Evans. And we're now ready to move to the challenges of Edmund Alexander Joran. That's a great name. South Mills River Precinct. Come on forward and swear in. Bring the microphone up. We note again while you're getting assembled that these uh, were dated April 14th, and we're still going to go ahead. May the 18th. Well, the top sheet says 414. Let's go forward, okay. please. Do you want to put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand? Uh, if you can solemnly swear that the statements and information that you're about to give today with respect to the challenges that you filed constitute the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. To the best of my knowledge, that is correct. Okay. He is now sworn. All right, I believe now, May I ask a couple of questions? Oh, absolutely, please. <laughs> uh, this is basically my information and doesn't uh -huh. involve anything the other board members have. Do you know any of the voters that you're challenging? Personally, know any no, of them? No, no, sir. How did you decide which voters you were going to target for challenge? And I'm asking you, not someone else. Well, it has to come from you. Okay. Well, because the you're, the pole, you're the challenger. I'm a, yeah. Okay. And on the totem pole, I'm the guy that walked the streets and, and visited the places. I was given, we had a master list of people, and I was given certain properties to go to. I live in precinct some were there but some were up in Mills River so uh, but to the best of my knowledge I don't know of any of these folks you were just given a list that is in correct. order to, to follow through I was given it. properties remember mr. Wilson we started out I looking understand. at places with eight or more addresses at one or excuse me eight or more names that's, at that's one why address. I, that's why I asked the question yeah. about how and it was so determined. what we did because there are so few of us we went after the larger number of people at one address to try and make as big an impact as we could. Okay. Do you think that in the challenge process that some of the people that you are challenging may be mistakenly removed? To the best of my knowledge, since we followed what I believe were the rules in sending letters out to the addresses and getting 
getting them back, you know, return the sender, no, no such address in this particular case, or uh, moved, no forwarding address. So, you know, to the best of my knowledge, we, the people You follow the procedure, I'm not asking procedure. that. I mean, you yeah. follow the procedure. What I'm asking is, do you think that it's possible that we're gonna make a mistake on some of these that are challenged? You know, it's always possible that something could fall through the crack. I, you know, I, I, do I think it will? I don't think so, because I think we, I know on the ones I personally visited, I mean, I talked to managers at, at places and, and talked to them about the individual people. Village of the Wildflowers, we talked about last time, we had 36 names at one address. Well, you know, fortunately the manager was able to run down the list and tell me been gone two years, gone three years, whatever. You did a lot of knocking on doors. Uh, all of these, all the ones. Okay. Uh, you visited all doors. these sites. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you, in this you probably understand uh, what I'm going to ask you, but uh, are you aware that if we if we remove someone based on information that comes to us, the best the, we make the best decision that we can, yeah. and that voter shows up to vote. They've been removed, but they show up in the correct precinct to vote. They will not be allowed to vote. But if you have another voter that shows up in the correct precinct to vote, and they're asked to state their name and address, and they give a different address from the one that's registered for them, mm -hmm. that they will be allowed to update their information, and they will be allowed to vote. I mean, I just want to know if you're aware of that. So mm -hmm. if we make a mistake, on, on the challenges, if we make a mistake and remove someone and they show up in the correct precinct to vote, either at one stop or November the 4th, they're not gonna be allowed to vote. Even though we made the mistake and it's just an unreported move. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to make, make, make a uh, clarification. I think there are eight in here for a property at two Boylston Highway, which is up by the airports, Route 280. We couldn't find it. And when we mailed the letters, it came back no such number. So maybe there was a little apartment building or something there. So we'll, they'll taken. cover that. I'm okay. sure we'll go through, each, yeah. we'll go through each challenge. I'm just throwing yeah. these questions so out. I, so only, when you say that so I visit the properties in that right. particular case, I couldn't find it. I understand that. <laughs> okay. We covered that last time you were here. I, I just need more information sure. for me to make what I think is a reasonable decision on some of these challenges. Bob says this is a historic moment. It may be, but if we make a mistake and that person is removed mistakenly, that's tragic. That's not historic. And I think that uh, I know some of these voters who've been challenged and I voted to remove them, mm -hmm. although I know that they're still residents of Henderson County. They may not be living in that precinct anymore and people at the rest homes I'm concerned about those I'm in a rest home every Monday with a different group of people we go every Monday to one site mm -hmm. or another in Henderson County and we'll see a resident at Spring Arbor we is on, not the board not we the is. board I'm talking about the group I'm with. Yeah, I understand we'll see a resident on Monday here next month we go to Spring Arbor West and that same resident has moved to Spring Arbor West and it's possible that they haven't the last thing they are going to do is change their address with the Board of Elections. So if we vote to remove that voter on the basis of the information coming to us, and then later on we find out they've just moved across the street to a different residence because of the type of care that they need, we've made a mistake. And uh, well, I don't know, we, can't, we can't correct it, that's what I'm saying. That's why mm -hmm. I think we need to be extra careful about the decisions that we make. We can't correct that mistake. And if we deny somebody the right to vote, that's really a tragedy if they're supposed to be able to vote. That's uh, all I had. No, that's good. Uh, could I blend onto that? You can do whatever. We discussed this a little bit, um, we as Beverly and I did, uh, and as I understand it, we're not even allowed to offer that person a provisional ballot? Yes, no. I began to research the law book uh, earlier part of the week because we were going to prepare for instruction to the poll workers. Because under the previous State Board of Election guidelines, and I talked to a couple of other directors, we were under the assumption that if they voted a provisional ballot, that the board would be authorized to count it. This State Board uh, staff had a meeting this week, 
uh, and several members of the state board and inform me that they do not have that same opinion and they're going to render an opinion to all 100 counties in writing that if they're removed and they show up to vote either at one stop or election day, uh, they will not, they can vote provisional of course, but they're going to provide instruction to the boards not to count those votes. So that's where the concern is now coming from. Even if it's a provisional? Even if it's a provisional. Um, you don't have an option if we've removed them. You don't have an option yeah, after, Octo vote, after October the 10th. The 10th. Yeah. October the 10th. Well, they're telling us no, we can't. Well, all right. I'd, I'd like to make a proposition that uh, I'm sure the state board acts to its best knowledge. But we're sitting here representing our citizens. And I would request the director convey to the state board our concern and a specific request that if that was to happen, this removed person who's still alive came in. And, I already have. And, for, I, I, and they're you going did to render that opinion you did, you did it before this meeting. I'm saying based on this meeting, I'm requesting you to go back to the state board and say in those cases that we allow a provisional ballot and that the staff gets the data that surrounds it. And if in the opinion of that investigation, that voter should be allowed to vote, I that be said on the provisional ballot information and the board has I, that option. I even went as far to ask the state attorney, could our board make that decision themselves for our county? And he said, no, they would render that opinion in writing. I so appreciate I think you need to wait for that opinion in writing and then you can question whatever it might say. I be recommend that before that opinion in writing, you make our view known to the state board in case it affects their opinion. Okay, I've already done that, but I'll do it again. Not, you have not done it based on this meeting. Let's bring, now, let's bring that to a, a discussion among the board members, Bob. All right. If that's something that the board's going to ask and we, the yep. three of us need to. That's right. Can we, can we do it now or not? I'm for it and make a decision now. All right. I've laid it out. We need a motion. The motion would be that if a person who's gone through this process and been removed shows up alive, plausible reasons, we give them a provisional ballot, the staff gets that information, in that case be presented to the board at the uh, appropriate next board meeting so we can decide whether their vote should count or not. I'd like to. Okay. Okay, yes, so what he said, I move. Okay, but you've moved that in your position? I'll be against that motion because I think we need to wait until we get this statement from the state board as to what their thinking is and then reply to that statement. Will we have enough time to affect such a case in this election? Well, they come out with it next week. That, and that memo today, as you know, there was a federal hearing in Charlotte today, so I'm assuming that's where the state attorney was, so I haven't had a response. I emailed him about three and asked him was I going to get that opinion today, and I haven't heard back from him. So. Well, you have a two-to-one vote, so just carry it through. You have a two-to-one vote. I vote against it, and you two voted for it. So it's fine. Well, I know, but I'd like unanimity <laughs> if we're going to take it. Uh, uh, all right, I'm going to vote for that motion and record two to one, but honoring Tom's views on it. Uh, I think the, bo the board, the state board deserves to hear the feelings of this board, that's all. All right, given all that, I believe it's now time to have me read the names. Oh, you have a comment? I have one comment. I've been asked to read a paragraph regarding changes of address within the county from the... Uh, the statute. Where? This is F like Frank. Let me just read it and then. What's the source? Just hand it to me. It's from the North Carolina Legislature.net enacted legislation statutes, HTML by section, chapter, blah, blah, blah. Glenn, do you know what this is from? Yes. I mean, I'm. It's not the actual statute, it's an opinion about the statute? No, it's the actual statute. It's the actual statute. Yeah. Then what's the it's statute chapter and number? verse? Yeah. yeah. It's 163-82.15, yeah. change of address within the county, paragraph F. Thank you. 163-82.15. Okay. How long is it? Five lines. Go for it. 
my speaking pattern and might make it seven or eight. <laughs> when registrant disputes registration records, if the registration records indicate that the registrant has moved outside the precinct, but the registrant denies having moved from the address within the precinct previously shown on the records, the registrant shall be permitted to vote at the voting place for the precinct where the registrant claims to reside if the registrant gives oral or written affirmation before a precinct official at the voting place. I think that's speaking yeah. in terms to before the voters removed. Right. If the yeah. voter is removed, but, but y'all are talking. Yes, yeah. you're talking about the yes. cows are out. It's a different situation. Yeah. That's right. covered. Okay. That's covered as an unreported move. But if right. it's the voter has been removed, right, then okay. he is not allowed to vote. All right. All right. Are we ready to proceed? I'm going to read the first name and look up, and uh, we have a sparse population here. I think uh, there are four all people not represented at the front end here. All in alphabetical Timothy order. Shane Austin. Never voted. Any comments by board member or staff? Could you state the precinct also so we can have that for record? SMR, South Mills Record. South Mills. Mills River, yes. River, that's it. Uh, the records do show he's never voted. He's been on the records for a long time. Uh, so. so it looks like the recommendation there would be to accept the challenge. Do you have something? I just have a question. That last column there, is that the date that they registered? Uh, the next to last column, yes. The, the very end is talking about they have tax records. Oh, the outside of there. Why? Yes. Oh, okay. The other is the date they registered. Exactly. Uh -huh. So 32392 is the date they registered? Yes. Okay. Correct. I have a question. Yeah. I have printed these sheets off. Do you all want them? I do. Okay. Because <laughs> we'd like to see where you're getting the information yeah. from so we can compare it. All right. Are we ready for the next case yet? No. Yeah. Go ahead. We need to review this Please go and ahead. make sure it's sent. Uh, one thing I'd like to note, this letter did not come from Mr. Duran. It came from a voter integrity project out of Raleigh. The date it was mailed is back in March. Just for the record. Okay, what is the implication of that? Is this it's back to our record. discussion about how out, to, out of date the data is? No. That's one of the questions I had on who initiates the, the thing. And if it's not coming back to you, you didn't mail these letters. No. Okay, that's, that's all I need to know. You didn't mail them. It went directly back to somebody in Raleigh and then they forward these things to you for you to issue the challenge based on information that they're giving you plus your research. That's correct. And all the ones at this address, I just looked, the dates are the same. Okay. All right. We haven't made any decision on this one yet, have we? No, we haven't. Are we ready to? question before us is accept the challenge or dismiss it. Is this uh, the final challenge on these voters? This is the preliminary hearing. Preliminary hearing. these voters, yes, these 18. Do you want some comment from staff on this or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it appears this gentleman has been on record for a long time and hasn't voted. I would say he's no longer at this address and probably not within our county because um, we don't show him voting since what, at least 2000. So. I make a motion that we uh, accept this challenge and move it forward. All right. Timothy Austin, challenge is accepted. Next case is Cynthia Lee Baldwin. Okay, this is also addressed to Cynthia Lee Baldwin. Uh, the letter came from the Voter Integrity Project out of Raleigh. Um, Any comments by board or staff, please? Well, wait, uh, wait a minute, we're not finished. Yeah. 
if, if you'll get with us sometime in the future, we'll, we'll educate you on this. Because if you see by what you gave me, mm -hmm. this person is not even a registered voter. Mm -hmm. See where it says no results found? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've challenged someone that's not even a record. So that's an indiscriminate challenge. Yeah. I just that's printed that sheet problem. off today. So I, I, I just, well, this morning I got that information and I went in and looked each one up, you know, and printed them off. So. It should have been something done before because she was removed back in August and these were filed two days ago. So you see where we're trying to come from on this? Yeah. Just to be accurate I, in what we're doing? I, so it should have shown up. I understand 100% what you're saying. I mean, yeah. I do. Again, you're saying I, it should I never just, have showed up on this list, correct? She was removed right. back in August. He filed challenges two days ago, right. so if he'd done timely searches on these he would have known that she was not a registered voter yes so this should never have been on the list and therefore today is dismissed yes. true or false <laughs> true but we've spent a, an hour researching it it's <laughs> a moot point whether we deny it or not because she's and removed the already 25 if you look at the bottom of the sheets i did, I did this but morning should, correct but you yeah. should have done it before you filed it on the 23rd and then you wouldn't have filed it it's all right question is does the board need to it, I would have done it. does the board need to take action That's on this or not they're not a registered voter yeah, we don't need so to do anything. anything there's nothing to no do. action okay next case is Jill Marie Baldwin South Mills River never uh, voted okay same situation yep. I'm not sure who mailed it because it's covered up it is returned though she has been registered since 86 and never voted so. So I vote to accept this. Too. This came from the Voter Integrity Project, okay? I peeled this yeah. label back. All right, is there a motion to accept the challenge? Yeah, I move to accept it. The motion's made. Do you want a second? Or no? I'll second. All right, I agree. So, Jill Baldwin is accepted. The challenge is accepted. Next is Betsy A. Bisson, B-I-S-S-O-N, Flat Rock. Same thing. This is addressed to the P.O. Box that uh, she shows a record for her voting. It did come from Voter Integrity Project. Um, she has not voted. She does own property in our county. This is one of the things the state board we suggested to see. I can't tell you though if it's a rental. She shows a mailing address of Greenville, South Carolina. That could mean that's where she works or that could mean where she lives now. So we just need to submit that with that also as part of our research. Never voted since never voted. 96. No. Second. I agree. Betsy Bisson challenge is accepted. Next case. Thomas Russell Blos, B L O S E uh, S M R, South Mills River. I, I need to point out, as I was just informed, that the voter integrity return address in the top left of the envelope was there, but the letters were actually mailed from here. Were they returned to Raleigh? Yeah. So, they, but it still went back to Raleigh. And yeah, that is correct, okay. Mr. Olson. That's correct. Okay. I show this voter registered in 2000 and hasn't voted since 2000. Um, he is an inactive voter, but I think it's quite a while before he's scheduled for removal. He's inactive. He's yeah, listed he as inactive at the present this time. Year. Okay, but he hasn't hasn't voted at all. But he has voted since 2000. 2000. It's 14 years. I move to accept 
Thomas Russell Blos is uh, challenge accepted. Next case is Clifford Wesley Brown, South Mills River. Mr. Brown registered in 1999 and he has never voted, so there, he is an inactive voter. I think it's a while before he's waiting for removal to them. What's the total time for removal? They don't vote in two federal elections, they're yeah. removed. They're, they're removed to inactive after two federal, then after two more federals, they're removed. So it's a total of eight federal, it'd be 16 years before yeah. they would be No, eight fully. years. There's eight. a federal election every two oh, years. Oh, that's because right. I'm sorry. I was saying the right. So eight years and then they're removed. Yes, okay. that's the typical situation. Okay. okay, you had a question? Okay, yeah, I want to follow up on that because um, if, if he's never voted and he, and he registered in 1999, then what, he sits there for two years and then you realize that he didn't vote and then you put him in What happened is we have sent cards to his address uh -huh. and they've never been returned. Uh, okay. Either the people That's that received them, post office, whoever, could be people living, you know, they knew where to deliver them. Yeah, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only thing we can assume. Question on the card, sometimes they get delivered to the proper address, and even though that resident is not the person they're addressed to, they just trash the card. They trash it, and that creates major problems. Yeah, we have no way of knowing then if that person was not there. Exactly. Okay. And anytime we do a mass mailing, we go on the radio and newspaper and tell the people that there's going to be a mailing, please mark them, return the sender so we can get those cards back. But is there a motion on Mr. Brown? I make a motion to accept this challenge. Second. All right, and I agree. So Clifford Wesley Brown, uh, challenge is accepted. Next case, Allison C. Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, Flat Rock. Okay, this says she's moved. It doesn't indicate where. She did just register in November of 2012 and voted in November of 2012. Hmm. This could be a case like we were talking about earlier. Yes. So if she walks in to vote, even though she voted in 2012 and we'd, we'd accept the challenge and the current believed position is that she can't vote, that feels unfair. This is not the permanent Thing that we're doing here tonight, though, this is there are, other there steps. are there's one more step we have sure. to go through. But well, even at that, is, is something you might want to consider. This is really yeah. the permanent step because the next step is just simply to read their name, and if they're not here, you're going to remove them if they're if they're sustained for challenge. So yes, this this is really the important step tonight. <laughs> Ask. If they do not show up and they're simply they moved across town, they're obviously not going to get the notice that I mail them. So they're not going to show up to say, yes, I'm just an unreported move, but I do intend to vote in November. So we have no option at the second hearing except to, if the voter doesn't show because they didn't get the right. letter that you sent to exactly. them. It didn't come back to us, but the voter doesn't show. Right. Then it's automatic that they are removed. Yes. And this, but this voter voted two years ago. Yes. And this is the dilemma we have with the state throwing the cog in the wheel saying that they're- Exactly. That, that, yeah. uh, That's where the great concern has come from now yeah. when they've told us a couple of days ago that no, right. just because they moved across town and they, if they're removed, they're not going to be able to, they can vote a provisional, but from what they've told me, the instructions is going to be for the boards not to count. Well, I, I, uh, I, before I ask my compeers on the board what their motion would be, May I request that you bring this case by name to the attention of the state board when you give that feedback we requested. Now, what else from our board members? Can we sustain this until the next? I make a motion that we deny this challenge based on the 2012 voting date. That, that leans over in the direction that we're requested to is other things equal, we bend toward the voter. So. Yeah, and they're not. I mean, it sounds like the state's not. Yeah, so, but we wish to 
dismiss this one. Is that the motion, Tom? I'll make that motion yeah. that we dismiss this challenge. Yeah. Well, we don't. Well, the board, the board hasn't come, the state board hasn't come out with their reasoning behind this. Well. No, six, 163, 90.1. No challenge shall be sustained unless the challenge is substantiated by affirmative proof. In the absence of such proof, the presumption shall be that the voter is properly registered or affiliated. That's our dilemma. Well, the same proof is the same proof is being presented here, but I have a problem in in denying anyone's right to vote if it's this close. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't back off on those in the earlier meetings because I went straight along, right down the line with the letter of the law. Yeah. But sometimes I don't think that's the appropriate thing to do, and this is one of them. And I agree with you in this so. case. What's your opinion? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, letter of the law girl. Therefore. But I'd like to see the state board's reasoning on the denial of the, um, the uh, provisional ballot. Well, we're going to get that That's why was later, and, that, and, and do we shut the door on this case, or do we dismiss it for now? Because well, it, it always can be raised again. Exactly. Yeah, it can be. Say. All right. So. It can be raised again after the, after. And he could, Burke could virtually raise it again before October the 10th, as long as it's not indiscriminately. Yeah, I have to go along with the dismiss on this one. You're struggling. What's your position? Yeah, I'd rather just be present on this, honestly, because well, I really make, want to see what the board's saying. Make, make, make we have to make a decision now. we got to decide, so two out of three for dismiss. We're not pressuring you to vote the way you don't no, want no, to. No, I just have to, the point is, Ms. Dodd, I don't want to see somebody not get their vote. Right, and so hopefully, we'll we'll have have that to. hopefully we'll have that decision long before October 10th. I'm going to have to go refile. with the board because I, I really can't. All right, I see a frantic hand. What is, what is your comment briefly? It's my understanding this board's already announced that it's going to hold another preliminary hearing on October the 15th at 2 p.m. Is there any reason that this particular case can't be tabled until that and to take up at that time? In which case, I think the law says you have to sustain it or dismiss it. But, but I, you indicated the person, we know the person has moved but we don't have an address for them. If we know they've moved, it seems to me that it's prudent of us as a community to expect that if we know that, then there's an address we can get our hands around. And, and if we have that, take that off the table. You've already, as a board, in the previous hearings, already eliminated people like this, voted two years ago. Now you're changing that. And, and it seems to me that we could, if, if we could do a little bit more work to find out where they moved to, that would be in fairness to that voter and everyone else sitting at the Yeah, yeah who's we? Who's we don't we? have time to do it. Yeah. And do you know there are seven, how many thousands of people do you think there are in Henderson County today that have moved in the past two years that have not updated their address? I don't know, I'm worried about the one that you said yes. Well, that's the problem. If we started with one, we would be expected, expected to do that with everybody. Yeah, that voter has a responsibility too. We're setting a precedence too. there. I understand yeah. that, but, but for the sake of, of, we're challenging based on the person no longer arrive resides at an address. If we have reason to believe there's another address, and you have this dilemma that the state's creating for you of modifying the statute leading up just before an election, that would seem to me to be a prudent alternative to just merely judging this now. Put it off till the 15th is my suggestion. Well, are we legally able? But my comment, okay, so if you, um, if you proceed down this path, we could, you, it's setting the precedent that everybody who's moved, who has not That's given us an address change, ought to or could be challenged and removed. We have over 6,000 inactive voters currently, and, and so you're opening the door. That's not counting the people that have moved that are not inactive. And so you're opening the door to challenge every single voter who's ever moved and hasn't told the Board of Elections. Do you we understand that? Well, how does you know this person moved? It's we're, we're not saying, we're saying that they voted the last general election, so they possibly have moved within the county. And if we did not remove them, then when that person shows up to vote on November 4th, 
We've disenfranchised that voter because they're not going to be allowed to vote according to what the state ruling is going to be from what we've been told. A question, I have a question on this, Beverly. If, uh, if we deny this challenge, can the voter be challenged again in this next preliminary, or would that be an arbitrary and capricious challenge? You know, that would be up to if this is, ever comes under investigation by someone, that's the only thing I can tell you. That's not for me to say, but it could be if it's state board investigated it. Well, I'm still going to make that motion, and I know that's a reversal of my position in the previous situation. We all can do that with further enlightenment, Tom. No, no apology needed. I'm same. not apologizing, <laughs> just stating okay. that I'm um, okay. reversing I'm my position. On the same line what Cliff was talking about and we're setting a precedent, we're right here by I, I'm seeing it as if we, I thought we already uh, voted on this deny year. this one, then we'll, we'll therefore have to deny every one that we've got the letter sent back that has voted in 2012. Is that correct? I would vote that way, but I, so that's, that's up to you as a board member. That's up to you as a board member. I'm still hesitant about doing that until I see what the state board's coming. Well, we can't. It's already we, been voted on. This we, we can't not here. decide. That's the problem. So, right. So th th this is this is setting the precedent now. This anybody that has a card that's come back um, that says they don't live there, but has voted in the past two years. Yes. And you asked earlier, had any other county set this precedence? And yes, Baltimore County did. They did not remove anybody that voted in 2012. So yes, that precedence has already been set. Okay. So it's the same as even before the. The memos come out from the state That's board. Right. You're right. So the dismissal is it's been voted. This is what it's been voted on. All right, I'm going to the next case. Stephen Kane Crisp, um, oh, South Mills River. Never voted. Oh, wait a minute. Never voted since 1998. Is that correct? Yes. All right, let's turn to that case. It appears he did register in 96 and hasn't voted in a long time. And that 2017, is that when he's scheduled to be removed? Yes. And so he's inactive at this time? Uh, is Chris, yes. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Is there a motion? I agree. Mr. Crisp is re, it has the challenge accepted. Next case is Laura M. Happel, H-A-P-P-E-L, Flat Rock. We can't see who sent the letter on that one. Either. Well, let me it's the same one. It's going to be the same one all same over. Yeah. That's right. They did register in 2008 and have not voted since 2008. And are they active? Are they, they are active, yes, because that's not been eight years. So. Okay. But they're, not even, they're not even removed to the inactive list for whatever reason. I want to discuss that later. Um, now's not like the time, but I did talk to the attorney about that four year, eight year thing. Which attorney? Don. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And? Well, I, we can talk about it when this is over. Does it apply to this case? No, no. Okay. Um, so did I hear a motion? Was there any oh. other comment by staff or board? Mrs. Happel is a actress, and she, and her address was the Flat Rock Playhouse. But she's been hadn't performed there in s several years. So. Well, they come and go, and some stay. I right. make a motion that, that we move this challenge forward. Accept. Okay, I agree. Next case is Don L. Hitchcock, South Mills River. She's another one that's been registered since '98, and uh, last time I showed her voting is in '98. Is she still 
active? No, she's inactive. But I think she's several. Oh, I see it, 2017. Yes. Is there a motion? I'll move to accept this challenge. Second. Agreed. Dawn Hitchcock, challenge accepted. Next case, Alyssa Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. East Flat Rock, is that? Yes. That's correct. Never voted and uh, registered, however, in 2013? Yes. Comments on that? So she's active. She just registered. She hasn't, there has not even been a general election that she's been eligible to vote in yet, so. So why know. would she be on this list? Because something didn't get returned, is that it? Because of the letter. Yeah. So the letter comes back, but the voting card you all sent didn't. What, what's Oxbow Lane? Is that the? Uh, That's a uh, Sunny View Family Care Homes. It's a, uh, I don't know, Section 8 living. housing. Assisted yeah. living. Assisted living off of Upward Road. She's only uh, in her mid-30s, so. It's a. It's a per, uh, disabilities yeah. more than elderly. Right. Well. Yes. yes. Yeah, there are two, that's right, there are two properties there. This is only one of them. But she just registered, you know, whether she ever intends to vote, we can't tell you. She may have registered because she needed to do it for some type of services she's receiving. But she never could have voted. There would right. be no right. election for right. her. So it's not, not like a bad action, it's just a neural opportunity. But well, she could have voted back in the primary. Mm -hmm. Correct. The challenge is based on the address. It's not based based on residence on nothing else. Correct. It's just the law is copied. I think um, it's, it's contrary because your card didn't come she back, so therefore it's she assumed that the she's there. She but this came back, so therefore it's assumed she's not. So the law is contradicting itself, right? In the face. We're we're assuming that she's registered, and since she just did that recently, she's probably moved to another nursing facility. And I don't know that that's public record. There's certain things we can't discuss that are on her record that's not public record. It's where she registers. We can't make that public record. Okay. I make a motion that we deny this challenge on the basis of that she hadn't had an opportunity to do it. Yeah, let's give her an opportunity. Okay, next case is Tom N. Marhenke, H-M-A-R-H-E-N-K-E, Flat Rock. He registered in 2004 and voted in 2004. It's another flat rock actor, yeah. playhouse actor. This yeah. Is, uh, is he active? He is active. He would be active. Yes. I move to challenge this. Second. Okay, I agree. We accept the challenge on Marhenke. Next is Jeffrey Miller. Question mark, East Flat Rock. We do not have a Jeffrey Miller registered at East Flat Rock. Do you have any clarification, Mr. Challenger? Not know. Let me make sure the alphabet's still right. I have no attachment. You don't have one? I don't have, Mr. Miller. I move that we deny this challenge on the basis of no information available. So, so we have no envelope? I, I, have no, I have no documentation with me. So, so the documentation, yeah, is in the comment with that. I didn't see any. So we need to dismiss, is that true? Yeah. Okay, we agree that will be dismissed. Christopher T. Simpson, Flat Rock, is next. Okay. Any inputs from board or staff, please? He registered and April 2006 and voted in November 2008. Six years ago. Is he still active? Yes. 
still active? Yes. I'll move to challenge this. Second. Okay, let's accept the challenge as agreed to. Next case is Katie L. Soika, S O J K A, Flat Rock. Never voted. Registered in the year 2000, 14 years ago. Any data from anybody? Here is the envelope. She registered in 2000, has never voted. That's the same as those people from Flat Rock Playhouse. Flat Rock Playhouse. Okay, uh, that looks like an. Well, what's your motion? Accept the challenge, Tom? Second. Agreed. Challenge accepted. Next is Melissa Lucinda Wilson, South Mills River. Mm. Never, oh, she voted in 96, registered in 91, due to come off in 2017. Correct. Okay, is that because of the eight year rule? That's because of when she went inactive from a mailing, I think, this year. No relation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there a motion? Sir. Agreed. Melissa Wilson accepted challenge. Todd O. Wren, W R E N, Flat Rock. Voted in 2010, I guess. Registered in 98. Playhouse. Different address. What was the last playhouse? Box 310? Yes. Move to challenge on this. Second. Agreed. Todd Wren, challenge accepted. Final one. Brenna N. Yeary, Y-E-A-R-Y, Flat Rock, voted in 2012 and registered in 2010. Any, any data by challenger, board, or staff? She voted the last year, that was all the we had. She might be on Broadway now. That's a house. PO box 310 again. So even though that's a 2012 address, I would vote to I'd make a motion that we accept that challenge. Okay. Second. I'll agree. She is accepted. That completes this list. Are there any other challenges brought forth that we know of so for tonight? I don't have any. Okay. I believe that this portion of the uh, meeting is over. And. Uh, I'd like the board to stay for discussion on the process uh, that we've dealt with a little bit to affirm that we're going to go with the 30-day rule and any related items. You're welcome to stay or depart. And thank you very much again for caring enough to be here. Appreciate it. There's a, a voter registered database. All the voters are in there in a computer. State has it, we have it. And then from that, how do we update it? Well, first of all, there are updates, which I didn't uh, record here. There's people that moved to town and update their records. Come in. Then we have felons. We work in the Department of Corrections, the district courts, the state board, and the county board. Monthly, we remove about seven crooks per month in this county, okay? Then we have deaths, and it's required by law that the funeral directors send the death, official death certificate to the Register of Dreams with the Deeds, which is Nedra Moles, gonna be Mr. King, and that goes to the State Department of Health and Human Services, and then across over to the State Board, and then back to us. That takes about three months, roughly. Correct me if I uh, trespass. We discovered under uh, Tom's tutelage and time when he was chairman of the board and Betty Gash was on it, when we looked at this, that why don't we get it straight from the Register of Deeds to our county? So we tested that and it looked like it works fine and we're continuing that. 
So we're no more than a month out of date on removing dead voters, except if people are uncaring enough to die out of county, or out of state especially, or out of the country, it may take quite a while for that name to drift back. So there is that little imperfection. And we remove about 100 dead names per month. Uh, there's a category called duplicates, and we were starting to talk about this, so you may have to guide me on this or tell me not to talk about it. I don't know. But I think we remove duplicate names between us and elsewhere at some handful rate. And then finally, we come to the area that is of festering interest to all of us, and it's the no contact news, which includes the physical moving of people from their residence to somewhere else. Now, there's no law that requires people who move to tell anybody. And I go back in my own life and I moved around the corporate world, and Lord's sake, you never even thought about the board of elections. But there is a process, imperfect as it is, in two federal elections, which is four years of activity, they're moved to an inactive role, <coughs> not been heard from, and after four more years, they're permanently removed. Now that, can be debated if that's too long, but then we have to change the law. And then we also use the uh, U.S. Postal Service for national change of addresses and uh, Department of Motor Vehicle audits. <coughs> and the problem with it is it just takes time and lets us feel uneasy. But there's that much of a process in place. And you have to compare this to the founding of this state when the way voting happened was you had to own 50 acres of land and be a male and show up and give a voice vote at the county steps where all the people running for office could hear you size up whether you're for me or against me. And over time, that's changed from paper ballots to what we do today. All right, so this is about where we are. Now, I want to make one point very clear, and that is I talked to Jeff Hunt when he was in what's now Greg Newman's job about a year ago, and in our district, not just our county, our district, our uh, district attorney's district, there have been no fraud cases for 18 years bar that, that went to uh, court <coughs> except for one case. So we don't have a huge fraud problem in this area that we can find. This is not Center City, Philadelphia, it's not Raleigh, it's not a place where there's a large dormitory situation with mischievous kids. And, and that's where the concentration of effort, in my opinion, needs to go to solve the fraud problem. Now, given that, today we are here officially and are open for business as a hearing. And we'll now proceed with that, and I'm required by the state to read certain uh, laws that pertain. And I know some of you have heard this before, so please bear with me. Ah. Referring to 163-90.1, if you want to record this number. Burden of proof. Challenges should not be made indiscriminately and may only be made if the challenger knows, suspects, or reasonably believes such a person not to be qualified and entitled to vote. Now that conveys intimate, almost one-on-one -on -one knowledge. B, no challenge shall be sustained unless the challenge is substantiated by affirmative proof. In the absence of such proof, the presumption shall be that the voter is properly registered or affiliated. That's the burden that is on us as a county board. We have to, if there's a, any question at all, we have to decide in favor of the voters' rights. I now go down to 163-90.3, making false affidavit perjury. Any person who shall knowingly make any false affidavit or shall knowingly swear or affirm falsely to any matter or thing required by the terms of this article to be sworn or affirmed shall be guilty of a class I felony. And you may remember I pointed out there are 10 classes of felonies, A, B1, B2, down through H, and finally I, which is where this kind of fraud goes. The penalty is three to 12 months in jail, and usually judges let them out early. And now I'm going to refer to part of 163-8215, change of address within the county. Uh, going down to D, unreported move within the same precinct. The registrant who has moved from one address to another within the same precinct shall, 
notwithstanding failure to notify the county board of change of address before an election, be permitted to vote at the voting place of that precinct upon oral or written affirmation by the registrant of the change of address before a precinct official at that voting place. Okay, and again, the law is siding by the side of the, the voter, the forgetting errant human voter. E, unreported move to another precinct within the county. If a registrant has moved from an address in one precinct to another precinct within the same county more than 30 days before an election and has failed to notify the county board of the change, the county board should permit that person to vote. The county board shall permit the registrant described in this subsection to vote at the registrant's new precinct upon the registrant's written affirmation of the new address, or if the registrant prefers, at a central location in the county be chosen by the county board, which would be here, I believe. Okay. If the registrant appears at the old precinct, the precinct officials there shall send the registrant to the new precinct, or if the registrant prefers to the central location, according to rules which shall be prescribed by the State Board of Elections. At the new precinct, the registrant shall be processed by a precinct transfer assistant, according to rules uh, which well, shall be prescribed by the State Board. Any voter subject to this may instead vote a provisional ballot according to the provisions of GS 163-166-11. When the registrant disputes registration records, if the registration records indicate that the registrant has moved outside the precinct, but the registrant denies having moved from the address within the precinct previously shown on the records, the registrant shall be permitted to vote at the voting place for the precinct where the registrant claims to reside if the registrant gives oral or written affirmation before a precinct official at that voting place. So what we see here is the law is, uh, rightly or wrongly, written to shore up and protect an individual's right to vote, even in odd cases. Given all that as background, let us now proceed to the details of the hearing. Ah, got to find that. Here we go. Uh, we've read all the important things here, I believe. Uh, Ms. Judy Evans. Would you kindly come forward, be sworn in, and let us proceed? And welcome. Okay, you get sworn in by... Okay, if you'll place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear or affirm that the statements and information given today with respect to any of these challenges constitute the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Okay, the first case is Richard Michael Bauer. Well, now, um, I did uh, send an email to both you and Mrs. Cunningham about some voters that I discovered after I filed the challenge had either changed their address or had been um, removed. So uh, Richard Bowerman is one of those. All right, so we should dismiss him. Yes. Motion by a member of the board here. That's one of you two. Okay. Um, he updated his address. Yes. That's, That's right. He updated okay. his yeah. address. I move to dismiss that challenge. Tom? Yeah. Your position, Tom? I agree. He agrees? Okay. We all agree that's a dismissal. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, what was the date that he, what was the date of the challenge? The, which one? That one, first, that one about where it was removed? No, the first date of the challenge from Ms. Evans to 924. 924. No, 922 is the date oh, of the challenge. But he, uh, Mr. Bowerman had previously been challenged by one of the other challengers, and we had told him at that time his address had been updated, so the previous challenge was dismissed. So okay. he's been challenged once before? And we dismissed that challenge. Well, the first one, this, Beverly, is that, is he, that was, he was challenged, I believe it was a uh, Canuga Chapel, if I look at his previous address. And we told her that he had updated his address to Wetmere Street. And then he was also challenged at Wetmere Street. But he had just updated to that address on 729 2014. 
Is that uh, Baron? Is he the? Uh, is he a teacher at North Anderson? I believe he's at Apple Valley. Apple Valley. Yes. Any further question or comment? Well, I think that you know, Ms. Evans is removing her challenge, but it looks to me like they haven't done the research in advance of that. You know, I have a problem with some of these challenges that are coming to us on this basis alone. That the first time we dismissed the challenge and explained that it, the, the person had changed their address, and now all of a sudden they're challenged at the address that they changed to. Could I answer that? Uh, well, just let me finish. Okay. I can get my thoughts together here. Um, I think that uh, we're being placed in a position by, by the challengers of having to make some decisions on the basis of incorrect information coming to us from the challenger. Uh, if you updated your information, which you said that you did, and you removed this guy as a, cha as a challenged voter, you should have had that information prior to sending the, sending the challenge to us on the 22nd of September, because he was changed the 20th, according to this, the 29th of July. I have no, I don't have information as to when it was changed. I only know that when I went in and looked it Where up, did you get the he information? changed it. Where did you get the information on this voter? Originally from the IP North Carolina. But what I'd like to say well, is that the first the time. They did the research for you. The VIP did the research for you. You didn't do the research yourself. No, I actually went to 130 Canuga Chapel and talked to the people there. Okay. And they told us that this man did not live there any longer. It's a conference center, right. that he didn't live there any longer. But you didn't go so beyond that. So we challenged him. Mm -hmm. And when the challenge, you'll remember when we did the first challenges, mm -hmm. we were told that if they had a mailing address, we needed to send it to the mailing address also. So that's what we did. We sent it back, we sent it to the mailing address and the mailing address at box 250 Hendersonville 28793 came back as not deliverable either. So I had two addresses where we couldn't find him. So I challenged him. But you didn't check, you didn't check in the uh, board information, the information online here with the website. I, I did not, I did not have time to check that before I left town. So I checked it when I got home. But this was 729, updated address 729. Had you done a check? I don't July check August? it every day. If you've done something in August. It, he was, he was, this was challenge was done at a hearing here in August. And they were told at that time that he had just updated his address on 729. Yeah. So it wasn't the fact that he had a different address on record. It was the fact that he had already been challenged once. And it was on the spreadsheet that was given to all the challengers that came in. And Miss Evans, I'm sure, picked one of those up. And it said he had updated his address. And it was said at the hearing she may have just simply missed it or Possible. But that's possible. No. It's hard to hear in here. But the what? Research. Let me let me finish what I let me finish what I my thoughts here on this, and then I'm, we're going to dismiss this challenge anyway. So it's not a, you've already just, we've already decided that. But uh, just had a question on it. We've made several mistakes. I've made several mistakes. I don't say we. I'm speaking for myself on on looking at some of these, and they've come back to bite us. I mean, two of them already have. Thank goodness they got caught early enough and they were able to re-register after we removed that voter. And they have, people who are removed have no alternative now. They have none. If we remove them incorrectly, then they're not gonna be allowed to vote. That's why I have some problems with some of these that are coming through now because of the possibility that they have just moved somewhere else in the county. Even though you got the information back and you couldn't find this fella, uh, he still lives in the county. And now he's gonna get the vote because he came by an updated address of EYSMU. But if we run into this problem again, if we have four or five of these that show up on election day to vote or at one stop early voting to vote, and we have say, 10 of them who show up that way and they're just moved somewhere else in the county and they complain to the state board, I would not be surprised to me if the state board fired me and I'd expect them to do that.
because I hadn't followed through on the information. And if, uh, if you check the website on all of these, and it appears you did later, you must have done something to get the information now about those that you had challenged that you don't want to challenge. Them. Exactly. But if, uh, if we had followed through on that challenge and our information was incorrect and they're not going to be allowed to vote, we've got a problem. And that's not your problem after the challenge is resolved here. I mean, after we go through this, that's not going to be anything that you have to deal with, but certainly we will. I have a problem with that. Okay, let's go on to the next one, Bob. I'm sorry if I took you. No, it's all right. Any other comments? All right. Uh, I'll make one observation. We have not heard finally from the state board as to whether a provisional ballot given to such a person can be counted. We're awaiting that decision. We pleaded that it would be possible. We have not got the answer. All right, next case is Heather Nicole Davis. She says never voted. Any comments by staff or board members? Or might have, sorry, you didn't need to present the case first. Um. The only thing in regard to Heather Davis that you should know that she did not register until November 2013. Is that correct? So she is a recent registration. And I'm sorry I didn't get that in the comments. Okay. She's re registered when? November 2013. So her only opportunity to vote would have been back in the primary. All right. So if she's registered that short time ago, we have to dismiss it, I believe. Yeah, we have to dismiss it. Well, let's let her present her information before we make a decision. Do you want to present any more information on that case? No. Okay. The next case is Nancy Durant. Uh, we didn't take any action on that, Bob. I'm sorry. Let's take these one at a time. Yeah, I thought we were. Well, we haven't decided anything on, on uh, Heather Davis. Okay. Go ahead. And this is just a return return on yeah, right. I think I heard my colleague to my right. Well, it's just it's a conundrum because you know she registered so such a short time ago, yet the letter comes back. But the board discussed it and felt like um, we need to give because of the statute the one the moving statute without mm -hmm. reporting your address, that we would give them some more time. I'll make a motion that we dismiss this challenge on the basis of the late registration, 2013. Okay. Second. Up? I agree. All right, are we ready for the next case? Nancy Durant. Um, Ms. Evans, your comments? Um. I handed the envelope over that she doesn't live at this address. That's the basis of your challenge, of the return, return. And she has been registered, registered since 1989, and we do not show voting history as back as far as seems. I make a motion that would move this to the next level. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's got to carry sustained. forward to the final hearing. To challenge, sustained. okay, sustained. so that's going to gonna challenge. be sustained. Second. Okay, so that'll go to the challenge. Agreed. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, usually these, well, in the past, the affidavits were attached to these letters? I uh, attach them to the affidavits afterwards because I don't get the evidence until after. Okay, I'd like to see the affidavits, so that's, that's, uh, that's what I'm checking from. Okay. Well, I mean, you have a question in regard to the affidavits? No, it says I'd like to look at. The, the totality of the says. evidence. Yeah, I know. I basically. Okay, uh, we're on Mrs. Mrs. Durant, right? Dismissed. She has Mrs. Durant, Hendersonville 1, it was dated September 22nd, 2014, by Miss Evans. And all of these are because the person is not a resident of the precinct in which he's registered. Right. It's a residency challenge. That's what you want to sit next to her so you can look over those affidavits? Maybe next time we all right, uh, we have settled Durant. I'll make the motion. Yeah, we, do, uh, we have that as the challenge goes forward. Right. All right, uh, Philip Gentile, last voted in 2006. Uh, Ms. Evans, you're... Uh, okay, the, the challenge shows Philip Gentile, Gentile, Park Ridge, 
Our same system shows he registered in 2004. He is an inactive and he's not voted since 2006. He, I'm sorry, he is active, is not? He's inactive. Inactive, okay. And he wasn't contacted either address. I didn't hear that. He wasn't contacted at either address. Both letters came back. So. Yeah. Any other comments or questions by board and staff or counter? Okay, what is your motion? I move to accept this challenge. Second. All right. Then uh, number four, Philip Gentile, uh, the challenge is accepted. Next uh, case is Bethany Gessler, last voted in 2010. Okay, the challenge shows Bethany Gessler of Flat Rock Precinct, dated September 22nd, 2014. We show a registration date of 2007. The last time she voted was 2010. Uh, a question, Ms. Evans. These were mailed for you by the Voter Integrity Project. No, I mailed them myself. You mailed these, but they didn't return. They didn't come back to you. Um, some of them came directly back to me to a post office box. Some of the early ones um, had a return address in Raleigh. Here's one that has a hand But I mailed them all. Some, some came back directly to you, but some did not. Correct. Some went to Raleigh. I called on this particular residence myself, and we were told that this is... Um, one of the former owners or a child of the former owner of this residence. Who no longer lives there or what? Who no longer lives there, yes. Make a motion that we sustain this challenge. Okay, here. Second. Okay, I agree. That challenge is sustained, so it'll go forward. The next case is Marjorie Gilman, who last voted in 2007. Any comments? Uh, just a moment. Ms. Judy? Oh, that's the obituary from the Times News, which I know isn't um, valid, but it just might help you with the date. Okay, we show Marjorie Gilman, Laurel Park Precinct, registered 1982. Uh, last time the vote was uh, 2007. Well, it sounds like she's deceased says that she died 82108 out of Henderson County, in fact, out of the state, I oh, believe. That's an interesting case. So out of state, and that has still not come back through the state-to-state -state system Correct. to us. We make a motion that we sustain this challenge. Second. Okay. We're going to sustain that means we carry that forward, okay? The next case, uh, even though it looks like she's dead, we don't have the legal proof. Is that the problem? <coughs> Okay. Um, Wilma Grimes. Okay, Wilma Grimes of Laurel Park. She registered 2005. The last time I show her voting is 2008. Any comments, Ms. Judy? No. Any comments by board or staff further? Motion, please. I move to accept this challenge. Sorry. All right, so we're going to sustain and carry that one forward to a challenge. Um, next is uh, Howard Hover. He this updated his address. So we ought to dismiss that? Is that right. That that's one? one of the ones that I asked to be dismissed. All right, so that's a dismiss. Next is... Uh, any comments from anybody? He was challenged before at the same address, so that's the reason for the dismissal. Okay. All right, next is Megan L. Hall, H-U-L-L. -L. No voter history in SEAMS, which is a state election information management system. That's where the voter registration database resides. Yes, she registered in 2011 and has not voted. 
But she registered in 211, huh? Any comments? Further comments? No, this is one of the challenges from Canuga Chapel Drive that also had a post office box. challenge goes forward. Agreed? Yes. Okay, next is Autumn Rose Keegan with a K. And she was removed in 2014, so that's a dismissal automatically. Do we agree? On right. That? This is one of the ones I asked to be dismissed. Okay, thank you. How did you come up with the information on these things that you're asking to not be dismissed now? Did you do some more additional research after you return these things in, after you September 22nd. When I when I discovered that um, some of the uh, records that we had were um, not up to date, then when I came back, I went to the um, North Carolina public voter search and looked for everyone that I had challenged, and I found two addresses that had been changed, and I found six people who had already been removed. I have no idea when they were removed because the public site doesn't tell me that, but they'd been removed. So I sent an email to Mrs. Cunningham and copied Mr. Heldman on it and asked that those challenges be removed for today or but that was dismissed. Last week after we'd already done the research. So uh, okay. And they had all, challenges had already been filed, so. So we have to go through with this. We have to go through with the yes. dismissal or sustain. Exactly. All right. And I, make, I make a motion that we dismiss this challenge. Okay. And that is uh, oh. Keegan. We dismiss. Yeah, we don't, yeah. oh, okay. okay. Next case is Ronald David Keeter. Okay. Ronald David Keeter, North Blue Ridge, registered in 1990, has not voted since 2006. I have two envelopes for Ronald. David Keeter, one at One Ridge Road and one at Route 6, Box 68. Both came back. So the second one was the one you mailed to uh, the box number, or the first one? Yes. Originally, we mailed addresses to the, to the residential to the address. And then when we learned that we needed to send to the post office mailing address, if there was a mailing address, we went back and sent those also. Thank you for your diligence in that regard. Um, is there a motion to move this to a challenge? A motion to sustain. Move sustain. All right. Second. All right, then Keeter will go forward to the challenge. That's sustained. The next case is uh, Francis Edmund Lambert and dismiss, is that another typical example of a dismissal? Well, Lamp. she was removed in 2013, so I'm not sure why the challenge anyway. All right, so that's a dismiss She's automatic. She's moved in February of 2013. You have an envelope for her? I do have an envelope. It says deceased. Somebody wrote deceased on it. Well, she was removed from my, she's not a registered voter in Henderson County and has not been since February 5th, 2013. But really? you didn't write, that you didn't write deceased. Does. No. Voter Integrity Project. So this went back to Raleigh. Um, I'd have That's to look. That's the address, it's on the return yeah. address. But she had been removed in February of 2013 and was still challenged. That's hard to understand. It's hard for me to understand, too. Um, That's why I think sometimes these challenges are just kind of capricious in nature. Not this wasn't that, capricious at all. Not that you're doing that. I'm saying that. But if the information comes to you out of Raleigh, the list of names comes to you out of Raleigh, and they haven't done their due diligence, then they're at fault by giving you improper information. Uh, well, the information that they did give to me was from, Earl, from the spring. 
So it would have been March, perhaps, of 2014. This so moved in 2000. I know that's what's strange. I'm going to have to go back and look at that. There couldn't be two people named Francis Lambert, could there? Well, because this person's middle name is Edmund. Is it Francis Edmund? Francis H. Lambert. See, so this is maybe a different person. I think we moved We're going to dismiss it anyway. Dismiss it anyway, so that's settled. Next case is Teresa Large. She voted in 2012. Yes, she registered uh, in 1983, and she voted in May of 2012. Okay, what data do we have? 2012. That's pretty recent. That's pretty recent. I make a motion that we dismiss this challenge based well, on the lateness of the... Uh, Whoever, whoever received this envelope at 1820 Pisgah Drive wrote, moved out of state on it. I didn't write that. All right. Um, we're dismissing this challenge. That's where we are. Teresa Large, you're dismissing? Yes. That's what I'm, I'm motioning. Even though she's moved I, out of state? Well, I have no evidence of that except what they said right here. I mean, I don't know who wrote that on there, and neither do you. So my thinking is if she registered as late as 2012, it's a possibility she moved somewhere in the county. I have no way of knowing otherwise. I mean, I don't know who wrote this on the envelope. You didn't write it on the envelope. No, I did not. So you just take the envelope that comes back. Well, except that we called on all those addresses, and they told us also that those people no longer lived there. Possibility of that. They could have moved somewhere in the county. And the consistency was, it, you know, 2012, we would stick with that date. I think so. Okay, we're moving to dismiss Teresa Large. Next is Leroy, uh, Jeffrey N. Leroy, who never voted. Let's have the uh, comments, Miss Judy and Bev. Yeah, he's an inactive voter, uh, registered in 2008, never voted. He does have a P.O. box. Did you also send it to a P.O. box? Isn't that, that's the P.O. box. Yeah. All right. We sent it to Empire Lane first, yeah, okay. and then that came back, but he did have a P.O. box. So that's his P.O. box envelope. I make a motion to sustain this challenge. Okay, he Second. voted in 2012, so we will err on the side of the voter and sustain the challenge on that one. No, no, he didn't vote did. at all. He's never voted, Bob. We're down to Oh, I'm, I'm off one. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So what do we what do we decide on Leroy Miller? Sustain or? We're not down to, uh, yeah, we're down at Jeffrey Leroy. Yeah, Jeffrey Leroy is what I'm trying to say. I make a motion that we sustain that challenge. Okay, a second. You agree, so we sustain that challenge. Next is Dorothy May Miller. We have a question, staff does, in regard to that, because I only have a Dorothy Miller Laurel Park. Well, our records show one Dorothy Miller Laurel Park being removed and another Dorothy Miller. So I'm not sure what Dorothy Miller we're talking about. This is have a middle name. D. With it starts with a D. Okay. Dorothy D. Miller, 1870, Right. If you do future challenges, could you give us more information, like middle names? Okay. And even if you give us the address so we can pinpoint which person. Where would you, where should we put the address? Right below the person's okay. name. Okay. So which one are we on now, Bob? Dorothy Miller. Dorothy May Dorothy Miller. Dorothy May Miller with a question. She's already removed. Yeah, she has removed. This is one of the ones that I oh, asked okay. be dismissed. Well, we're skipping one then. No, there's Dorothy, Dorothy May and a Dorothy D. We're on Dorothy May. We're on Dorothy May who voted in 2012. Are you challenging Dorothy May Miller, Ms. Evans? No, okay. I'm challenging yes. Dorothy D. Well, I'm not challenging either one of them because Dorothy D has been removed. When was she removed? All right. Whichever one it is we're dealing with, I make a motion that we dismiss. She was removed February of 2014. Dorothy that's D. That's what it shows. Yes. Okay. All right, so that's a dismiss. And the one above it, 15, since that voted in 2012, that's a dismiss too. 
Is that what I'm reading? No, she's, she's not, not challenging chat. either one. She's okay. not challenging. You should know which one's the reason there's two names oh, there. Oh, okay. The top okay. one is, just strike it out. She's clarified that the second one on the list was the one she was challenging. Okay. So that should just be stricken out and yes, not move not one way or the other. That's number 15, huh? All right, and then we dismiss number uh, Dorothy D. So that's a dismiss. All right, number 16 is Jeffrey L. Miller, who never, Jeffrey L. Miller, who never voted. Right, and here's his post office box letter. We sent a letter originally to 24 Empire Lane. It was returned, and here's the one that was sent to his post office box. And it is a Jeffrey Miller of South Blue Ridge because I believe he was the one that Mr. Duran had challenged last time and didn't have the evidence. So this is the same gentleman and he registered in 2007 and has never voted. Make a sustain that challenge. Second. Okay, and I agree. So we sustain that challenge on Jeffrey Miller, number 16. Now, um, we have four in a row here Julieta Montes, Aaron Moore, Douglas Mosar, and Clara Owens. Uh, we, we prefer to move individually, but is this a cluster of dismissals? I think no, no. I think we need to go individually. A, the, All right, we then need we got to go. Individually, because this first one, I think. Uh, let's start with Julieta Montes, who never voted. What's the story? She she was just registered in May of 2012, so that's a decision by the board. Any comments, uh, Ms. Judy? No. Move to dismiss. Well, now she registered in 2012. Right. She's never, she hasn't voted yet. But she's never voted. Um, this is a question, and we're, again, we have to think about defending the voters' right to vote. Um, if we were to err, wouldn't it be better to err on the side of accepting the challenge? That's the question. You mean dismissing the challenge? No, accepting the cha accepting the challenge. It says she just registered in 2012. I know it. If you're going to err on the voter, you're going to dismiss the challenge. Gotcha. Well, do you have the date she registered in 2012? Because I have Maybe. May, so. There was a big election in November of 2012 when she might have voted. But she didn't. So but she didn't. Knows? She may have been sick that day. I don't know. To be consistent, we need to continue with this dis dis Yeah, we, right. we dismiss this one. All right. You need to have a motion to that effect. Yes, I thought I heard it. We haven't had one. All right. Motion to dismiss. Made second. second. Third. Okay. Had to dismiss. Uh, the next is number 18, Erin Moore, and she's already been removed. Yes. On that previous one, Cliff just looked her record up. She actually tried to register before that election, but she was in the cutoff period, so her record didn't, she didn't get to vote that election. She did. Yeah, it's a good thing we she dismissed She made a registration, so uh, that's, she had a late registration date, too. All right. So we did correctly in dismissing that one. The uh, Aaron Moore, who was removed in uh, 314. So you withdrew that challenge on Aaron Moore, is that Yes. Correct? And also on Douglas Moser. He was already removed by a challenge last month. Oh. All right. We need a motion on Moore and then on Moser to dismiss. Uh, a question, Ms. Evans. Why the challenge if he had been removed by a previous challenger? I don't um, quite understand that. I don't understand it either. For some reason, I didn't have Everybody's that documentation. Too, too confused, I guess. Okay. Right. I make a motion that, uh, and under Ms. Evans' uh, comments too, that we dismiss Aaron Moore, the challenge to Aaron Moore, Douglas Moser, and Claire Owens. Claire, Claire Owens, I have an envelope for. You have an envelope for. Withdraw that. Go to the first two. Yeah. Aaron Moore and Douglas Moser. Second. Second. Okay, okay. I agree. Uh, Clara Owens did not register until July 2012. Okay, but she yeah. did register. 
And any other comments? It sounds like a dismissal. Sure. I have motion. somebody wrote on here that she'd moved. Didn't say where. No. See, that's the hang up. You don't know where they moved to. I moved to dismiss. Second. Agreed. So we're dismissing uh, the challenge on Clara Owens. Next is number 21, Amy Patterson, who never voted. Yes, she's an inactive voter. She registered 1999, and according to Singh's record, she's never, no one's ever voted. All right, so um, how about the eight-year eight rule? I'm trying to, did you have a comment? No, just that there are two envelopes, one for her residential address and one for her mailing address. We probably, I'm assuming by the, we did a verification mailings and they were sent to the addresses and no one returned them, so that's why she remained on the record. You sent verification information yes. out and it was returned. Numerous times, yes. But I'll if they're not returned, to, uh, then according to the law, they remain, right. even though they're inactive, they're still on the record. Okay. Is there a second? Do we accept the challenge? Patterson, yes, second. All right, that's on Amy Patterson. We accept the challenge. And on Travis Patterson. I think he's the same, same address. Same address. Same registration right. date, inactive. I'm going to make a motion that we sustain the one on Travis. Second. Agreed. Patterson okay, as well. sustaining Patterson. And next is Talmadge Michael Pollard. Never voted, or voted in 2012. And he registered in 2012. Well, I think that's obvious dismissal. Uh, we sent envelopes to both his Maple Street address and his Spartanburg Highway mailing address, and they both came back. The Maple Street address is the rescue mission. Huh. Well, we have the 2012 issue. Yeah, well, we'll just stay consistent and move to dismiss. Uh, wait a minute. Are you moving to dismiss? Yes, yeah, he voted in 2012. Well, okay. Second. Yep. Stay consistent. Second. All right. Well, I'm hung up. If you voted in 2012. Okay, we want to dismiss it. Yes. All right, I agree. So we're dismissing the challenge on Pollard. Next case is Melinda Lee Ponder, voted in 2008. Yes, yeah, she's of Hendersonville 3 Precinct, registered 2007, <coughs> voted 2008. She's inactive. Since 2012. And she's scheduled for removal a couple of years anyway. I make a motion we sustain this challenge. Uh, second. And I agree. So Melinda Lay Ponder is uh, accepted the challenge. Next is Dorothy Sanchez, who voted in 2008. Yes, she's at Laurel Park, uh, registered 2008, voted 2008. So that's her last history. <clears throat> no address of where it moved to is provided. How do they know? What? What? Well, we have the same thing on this one, but I make a motion that we sustain the challenge. Somebody wrote on there, moved out of state. Right. By second. Okay. Agreed. So we're going to sustain the challenge on number 25, Dorothy Sanchez. Next case, Bernard Shebest, S A G V E S T. He is of Law Park Precinct. Uh, Registered in 1990, but has not voted since 2008. Somebody wrote on the envelope that he was deceased at one of the nursing homes, the one, that one on Pisgah, 1820. Um, okay, now that's an, that's an interesting case as to why that hasn't showed up in the deceased removal records. I don't know. Sustain this challenge. Of a second. When were he died? Somebody might know that he's deceased, but not, but he didn't die in Henderson County, maybe. Yeah, that could have happened. Okay. 
So we're sustaining this challenge? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, next is Digby Swafford. Both Who's Digby Swafford and Benjamin Tisenberg, who's probably the next person on your list, yeah. both of those have been removed. Get Swafford being removed? Excuse me? Swafford's removed. Yeah, we're checking Tisenberg. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. he was removed. What day? Or actually, he, he, was, he moved from county this, and we were notified October 2nd after these challenges were filed. Oh, okay. okay. So he wasn't removed. He just changed his address. Moved out of county. All right. So, we, so he was removed so from our, our county. Yeah, he's removed. Yeah. We need a motion then, please. Uh, dismiss. Dismiss. Yes. Dismiss. Your position. He's out already. Okay. Before we dismiss did. 27, 28. Is there more data coming out? Ms. Evans had withdrawn those challenges, so she didn't have any data. All right. I thought Cliff was looking up something on him. He did look up Zinsberg. All right. Is there a motion to dismiss? On more. On. Oh, I thought this was going to talk. Uh, yeah, he's been removed, so he's already been removed. Yeah, we're going to dismiss it. Nothing we can do with it. It says he voted in November 2012. They also told us he had been removed. He moved to a different county. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, we agree. That's a, that's a dismiss. Okay, number 29 is Laura Ward. Never voted. Yes, registered 2010, never voted. Here are two envelopes, one at Maple and one on the post office box. Accept that challenge. Um, number 30, Jessica Weinhauer. Okay. She is, she registered 2011, inactive, never voted. Okay, that goes to challenge. Next is David Harold Wold. Never voted. Correct. Registered 2002. He's inactive. Agreed. So that goes to challenge. Next is William Gary Woodhurst. He registered 2011 and has never voted. Move to sustain. Move to sustain. Second. Okay. We agree. 32 Woodhurst goes to the challenge. Tina Wu, Tina Vanessa Wu. She registered 2009, is inactive, never voted. Second. Okay, well that goes to challenge. I believe that completes the list. We, we want to go back to one. Please. Uh, Francis Edmond Lambert. Do you know if that's a gentleman? We have two Francis Lamberts of record. One has been removed. That's Francis H. And there's a Francis Edmont, which we think is the one that you want. Correct. 
he is a man, because we kept referring to him as a woman. Um, but he has, she, he has not voted since, what, 2008? Correct. So you, I think we dismissed that one. You might want to revisit that one, because that's not the one we thought it was originally. Which one is being challenged? The, the man. Edmund, Francis the Edmund. Edmund Lambert. Francis, yes. That's what we have here, Francis. Okay, but so. But Francis H. is the one that was removed, not Edmond. In other words, hey, our, our research oh, yeah. was incorrect on the wrong person. That, that confusion clued me in. I looked and was able to find the person that was actually challenged. Um, so she referred to him as looking. a woman, so we thought it was the same woman. We, remember we were talking about it a few minutes ago? Yeah, all right. But we think it's this man. No, right. I said it was a man. You said it was a woman. Because yeah. I had his name as Edmund, and that sounded like a funny that's middle name Edmont. for Edmund. He, with a T? So yes. you, think oh, we've you, removed, you think we've removed the wrong voter then in 2000? Uh, well, we dismissed it. We didn't remove anybody. But we think the Francis Edmont should be sustained based make, on her challenge. Okay, I make a motion that we sustain Francis Edmont, who was not removed in 2013. It was right. the Francis H. Yes. Right. Not, okay. Yes, and that was okay. Not well, and I and I certainly understand. We'll try and put addresses and middle names because that'll help all of us. Yeah, I when think. people have common names like that, it yeah. shows up and it's. Uh, all right. So um, we need that uh, seconded or yeah, something. I, just, I have a question. Okay, we've got a question on Lambert. So when did Lambert, Francis Lambert, last vote? I think you said 2008 is what was just Primary said. Primary of 2008. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I moved to sustain. All right, so And that, I actually think that was the envelope where somebody, another one of those envelopes where somebody had written deceased on the envelope, I do believe. It does say yeah. deceased. So just that might help a little with the research. All right, now okay. could, could we revisit uh, number 27, Swoford? So we're not and refresh that And refresh what we decided there. Which one? He was removed. He's, He's removed. removed. He's removed. Okay, so that's a dismissal. All right, any other questions of our challenger? Ms. Judy, we're all learning, and I want to thank you because thank you're you. a caring citizen. You've been trying. You've been learning with us. It's obvious that you have learned some things here. I want to sincerely thank right. you. Well, I think this will be easier now that we know a little bit more of what we need to do to make it easier for you to research. Yeah. The fact that if they voted in 2012, two years ago, you're gonna dismiss it, so we might as well not challenge them. And that um, we didn't know this, that we need to be a little bit more up to date on our records before we actually turn the challenges into you and that'll help everybody. So well, I so. promise to do that. Well, and we appreciate that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Do Thank you, you want to reiterate what the board decided as far as dates on challenge in the future at the last meeting? Oh, 25 days from... Any challenge form filed has to be dated within 25 days of the filing of the challenge. Okay. And that's been reviewed at state level as reasonable, so we believe that's solid ground. Okay. Um, we're almost ready for the next challenge. What's coming to mind here is that there, there are systems set up that appear to be working on deaths and felonies. And the only parallel I could uh, think of in the dark of night is that a law would have to be passed in these kinds of moving cases that requires real estate agents, renders of property, to fill out a new kind of form that would be signed by the seller and the person moving, saying they're moving as of this and such a date to that and that address, and that form would have to be filed through the state. And that is more bureaucracy, but I don't know of any other way to match the relative efficiency of the deaths, felonies kinds of approach. So we appear, unless some inventive mind comes up with a better approach, to uh, rely upon the volunteer efforts of caring citizens such as yourself which is appreciated, um, just an observation. All right, the next challenger is Mr. Glenn 
Engelram, is that correctly pronounced, sir? May I call you Bob? Uh, if you spell it correctly, yes. You may. All right. Uh, would you be sworn in again, please? Okay. I do solemnly swear or affirm that the statements and information given today with respect to any challenges constitutes the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I do. All right, would you present the first case, please, uh, Mr. E. Uh, Noah Lewis Di Stefano. Okay, he is inactive, registered in 1996, has not voted since 1996. Registered. Second. Okay, match is sustained, so that goes to challenge. Gregory Fisher is the second one. He registered in 92, has not voted since 2010. He has an address and a P.O. box. Is he now inactive? He is active. He voted in 2010. Not quite over the four years. Uh, question is, you didn't write that on there, somebody else did. No, sir. So, after this election, he would be sent a card, right? Next January. Oh, next January. Next January. The, the January after the four, four, four years. years. Right. All right, motion? I move to sustain. A second. Okay, that goes to challenge. Next is Amanda R. Hammett. in 2012 and uh, yes. do you have any comments as a matter of fact I do I think the point's been made about the contemporaneous nature of the data we learned noon today thanks to a canvas that mr. Duran performed at 32 Oxbow Lane that uh, this lady despite the fact that that the, the uh, second envelope was was postmarked September or uh, August 25th she's apparently returned to live at this address so as far as we know Today, Amanda Hammett resides again at 32 Oxbow Lane, and that was learned at noon today. That happened. Thank you. Uh, move that we dismiss this challenge. Second. Okay, and I agree, so that's dismissed. Thank you for that update. Next case is Amy Hennion. Any comments? Any comments by Don't staff? Well, <laughs> the challenger is first, the year's second, okay. and we're third. All right. Did I preempt you on that last one? Uh, registered 1996, inactive, hasn't voted since Okay, this goes to challenge, I agree. Next case is Brownlow King. He registered in 96, is inactive, and has never voted according to Seams records. We appreciate learning that the first batch came out of Raleigh and the second batch out of Hendersonville, so thank you for that. Second. Okay, that is number five who goes to challenge. Michael Anthony Klein. Registered 2007, is inactive and has never voted. I'm sorry, did you say he was in inactive? Did yes, you never voted, voted, inactive. So when's he scheduled for removal? He went inactive in 2011. Okay, so it'll be next year. I just wondered. All right, is there a move was sustained? Okay. Yeah, I'm second. That goes to challenge number six. Number seven, Jason Frederick Miles. 
He registered in 96 and he's inactive and hasn't voted since 96. Okay, we'll sustain, and that goes to the challenge. Next case is Stacy Lynn Moss. She registered in 96 and is active, hasn't voted since 96, though. She's still an active voter and hasn't voted since 96. I'm assuming she cards have went to that P.O. box and not been returned. In other words, our cards, our cards are mailed to update yeah. these. We've done every two years since 2005, right. and they're just simply not returned by the box holder. They really hold the box. It's not sitting in the back. Probably in the garbage can over at the post office. <laughs> you know, that's another thing. We've had a case of one, one of our beloved challengers, not here today, I guess, uh, may, uh, one of the follow-up letters we send to the I guess it was an order, we call it, that went to the voter and he also copied it to the political. Yeah. yeah. Post office sent it back. He wasn't there. And I happened to be in, in, in uh, Beverly's office. We called. Yeah, he's there. He answered the phone, talked about it. He said, that gum post guy he doesn't understand us out here where we live. So you get oddities in here, too. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Stacy Moss. Stacy yes. Lynn Moss. I move to sustain. Second. Okay, so that goes to challenge. Jeffrey Robert Skaggs. He registered in 92. He's inactive. Never, doesn't have voter history. Okay. Motion. Motion to Okay, we agree to go to challenge on that. The final one is Barbara Reed Winky. She registered in 2007, has no voter history. Is she inactive? No. Okay. She has, that, I think, that same field box, so whoever's got that field box just throws everything away. Motion? I move that we sustain the challenge. Okay, that goes to challenge. So on this page, everything is going to challenge except Amanda Hammett, which was dismissed. Does that match? Yes. Any other comments, Mr. E? No, thank you for your time today. Well, thank you for your efforts, too, very much. The next challenger, then, is Laura Atchison, who was able to make it today, for which we thank you. Would you please be sworn in? Sure. I do solemnly swear or affirm that the statements and information given above today with respect to these challenges constitute the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Okay, the first case, if you're ready. Yeah. Um, Sarah Catherine Hendricks, who's been removed. Yeah, I think that was resolved uh, since the challenge. Uh, these are my physical uh, former neighbors, and that's the challenge that I bring forth. I reside at 193 Banner Farm Road, and, and the house in question is 197. And um, Sarah Hendricks um, was actually an owner since Christopher Mondia, which is my other challenge. Um, I have printouts from the um, Henderson County website. I didn't bring, I didn't think about sending a letter to my neighbors that I know don't live there. Um, so um, if you want to look at this, it shows that Christopher sold the house to Sarah, who then sold the house to Katie, who lives there now. Um, so there's a copy for everybody. I called Christopher's work yesterday because Sarah was removed, right? Yes, yeah, she filled out a card herself uh, from the national change of address that we sent out recently and removed herself, yes. Okay. So that one we can dismiss, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Is there a she's motion? Not a, she's, not a, she's not a registered voter, so yes. So we can dismiss that case, but we yes. need a motion. Move to dismiss. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. We've uh, dismissed the Sarah um, Catherine Hendricks case now. Where do we go in Christopher Michael Mondia? Well, Christopher Mondia uh, resides in Philadelphia now, and <laughs> probably Center City. <laughs> no, uh, he, uh, I called his place of employment yesterday, which is Repo Records, and they said his next uh, scheduled day on was Saturday. And again, I didn't send a letter because it's my next door neighbor that, you know, we basically, uh, knew for years. He he moved out in um, 2008, I believe. Christopher did. Yeah. So. Tell us about the phone call again. Who did you call? I called Repo Records. It's his place of employment in Is Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And they said he would be at work on Saturday. Um, so he. In you know, Philadelphia. Yeah, in Philadelphia. So I, I don't think he's coming back. <laughs> This is an interesting case. Uh, I move we sustain this challenge. I don't think he, he's inactive anyway, I think, isn't he? I'll, I'll no, second 2008, that. 2008, it may be. But you have to do something with the challenge. All right, so we move that one to challenge so that the right process goes through. Now that completes the challenge. Uh, Beverly, would you uh, comment in two ways, please? Number one, describe the next step, which involves another mailing called an order, I believe, and so forth. Well, not the order. We, we will first have a full hearing on oh, the 29. Oh, that's right. Here, tw that's 29. Let's record that. And 20. that will be held at the King Street uh, meeting room, I believe is what they call it. It used to be the commissioner's room at 9 a.m. Because, of course, we'll be voting in here at that time. So okay. that's the location that we could have. Okay. So we will be mailing attempt to mail the people that's been sustained a notice of hearing for that day. Is All right, so we go, we go through that hearing, and uh, some may and most probably won't show up, and then what happens? Then after that, we will do the orders and uh, try to, again, contact those voters. And after that, if nothing happens, then what? Well, we will have already removed the voters after we do the order. There's nothing else for us to do at that point. We're going to hold an election after that. Okay. <laughs> now, I've, I've, uh, I've asked Bev to do other thing. What we're all learning here is about the process and its payoff. First of all, none of these people seem to be lined up as uh, fraudulent voters. Uh, secondly, it is a mushy area that is not as refined in procedures as deaths and felonies and so forth. So there's time involved. There's time of the volunteers and there's time of staff. And I asked Bev to guesstimate the cost involved by staff in doing the research work, et cetera, and prepping for these hearings. Um, just the best guess estimate on that. Um, we, we probably spent about $250 on mailing cost when we uh, you know, finished with these hearings that we got scheduled. Uh, probably about $300 in overtime staff. Uh, six to seven hundred dollars in uh, for board cost and just a general staff time of 175 hours so um, we're looking at probably if you count the staff hours also six to seven thousand dollars of uh, county money to remove these voters and how many are we talking about in total with the hearing so far uh, maybe 225 I was going to say two to three hundred people so we got a lot of hats on here. We want to have as pure as possible a uh, voting process with up-to-date records, and we've got expenses to look at for the county and the Board of Elections. So I don't, I'm not sure what that implies or what the outcome is. It's just information we should be aware of. Any comments from anybody? Okay. I, did I hear correctly that what was the cost for the board? Uh, six to seven hundred dollars. They're paying one hundred and twenty dollars for each meeting. We've already had oh. four, five. I'm going to have a couple more. That was six to seven hundred. 
not sixty seven hundred. Six hundred dollars to seven hundred. I heard I heard thousand initially, so I'm yeah. Six okay. Six thousand seven hundred. I'm like, it's my head. I heard six to seven thousand. Yeah, that's why I was okay, curious. Wait, wait a minute. But the board oh, okay, bought okay. seven hundred. The whole thing. Yes. I have the so impression that we paid one hundred twenty dollars a meeting because that isn't correct either. Yeah, because I thought you were all volunteers. Well, well, in a sense we are, it's, and we're compensated it's, for expenses. It's actually forty dollars a meeting. Forty. Yes, yeah, so that's forty. Okay. Forty is one hundred twenty dollars. Okay. Would, well, would I would include my overtime as chairman coming in early. Sure. And dropping by and all that. Sure. Well, I, I would. I have a couple of comments, and I, I've already thanked this this body for the time that you've spent. I, I think what we've demonstrated to each other is that the capabilities of this election board can be and have been expanded on a temporary basis when it comes to uh, list management. We've also heard along the way several instances, I submitted one today, a person who hasn't voted since 1996 and is labeled active in the system by almost any calculation on an a the average person in the county is, is essentially going to be saying, how is that possible that, that that could be the case? And what we don't know is this is a sampling that came from 45 addresses in the county where eight or more voters at the time were registered. So you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 voters out of 79,000 registered in the county. And so I would agree that the amount of time seems to me to be disproportionate in, in the sense if you want to get through that entire list. In the paper they reported that there, we, this board believes 6,000 voters are inactive across um, uh, the voter registration. What we don't know of this very important system that we have. And, and Bob's absolutely correct. I don't know of one instance in the challenges that have been submitted that we discovered any vote fraud. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit um, disappointed that the twist that the media has placed on this has not been the focus here. No one came before this board suggesting fraud. There's not been one case that we've presented to that effect. There's been no disenfranchisement that's occurred thanks to the board's judiciousness with regard to looking at the evidence and weighing, uh, I think, wisely in terms of the cases. Now, I do have a question, and that is, uh, earlier this year, you all had to move the polling place in South Mills River from a church to a school. And it's my understanding that at the time of that, you would have to notify each voter registered in that. And so my question is, as a result of that process, given the imperfections in the mailing system. So, so there's no change in the active versus inactive no. calculations as a result of that. Terrific, terrific. Because, you know, when one of the things this process teaches you is that your staff particularly is at the mercy of what happens when that letter lands or doesn't land in a post office box. Tom, how many times have you asked today alone whether anyone sitting here challenging wrote on the envelope? The answer is no. Somebody did. And um, we have, uh, as a result of the canvas that Judy's team did early in the year, we still believe there are 100 voters registered in this county uh, who were sent letters. Those letters didn't come back. And we've seen testimony here that you've had the same experience with voters. So I think what we've learned together, at least I hope we have, is that when we engage in this activity, we're not, anyone here is trying to defraud anyone of the right to vote. But there is an issue, clearly, statewide. 11% or more of the voters on the rolls are missing. We owe it to ourselves as a representative republic to make sure that when people are on our lists to vote, and in the absence of any due diligence uh, when, you turn, when you go to vote other than what's your name and what's your address, that we're doing everything we can to ensure one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. That's why we're here. And there's no other agenda here but that. And I can report, I reported last time, I'll say this again, the majority of the challenges that I know that I've worked personally, the, the majority of the voters removed were registered Republicans. And, and so the fact is this is not a partisan 
fill in the, you know, something hunt. This is merely looking at data that's grabbed arbitrarily and we take a look at it, do a canvas, convert that to letters. And I think we've learned our lesson that if the letter is sent from here, you have a comfort level about that letter that's superior than if that letter appears to have come from someone outside of Henderson County. We applaud that ownership here and I think going forward we'll, we'll certainly ensure that anyone that challenges uh, on, this, on this basis with letters will make sure that happens. So I thank you for your time. I know we're all kind of running in our minds to October 23rd and looking to get ready for that and we applaud and appreciate that. So I appreciate it. Mr. Heltman explained the NVRA process, the actives and inactive, uh, and this is something that we can't really do because we work for the Board of Elections. I'm not sure the board should even do it, but as citizens, this could be done. Um, the process is after two federal elections, they're made inactive. Then, of course, after the two more federal elections, they're removed. In that process, the second card is called a, and you correct me on this because she deals with this every day, but there's a confirmation card that is mailed. Okay, if that card does not come back, but as you've realized, and we've all realized, those cards don't come back because whatever reason, the post office, whoever lives there, whoever has the new post office box, if the law could be changed that the voter had to actually sign something and it returned to us. Now, whether this process as a law change could you know, be lobbied to the state legislators, whoever can change that, that would help to me, every county in North Carolina, because if the voter has to take an active part, sign something if, and to show us whether or not they've moved or not moved, and instead of it just being out there in space somewhere where we don't know where it is, and they remain on our rolls. And that, that, you know, it's a major concern of ours also, but we would love to see that portion of the law changed. And I have talked to the State Board of Elections about it and the State Attorney, and I think they're actually trying to work on something, whether they're going to present it to the General Assembly or what, I don't know, but we would like to see that somehow lobby to whatever particular avenue that needs to go through to change that portion of the law. Well, I would echo that. I know there's been some discussion about uh, talking with Congressman Meadows because actually you all are wed to the 1993 Motor Voter Act and that's foundationally why we're sitting here wondering about the imperfections. And when you've got just 80,000 records in the county, when you look at seven and a half million records statewide, you go, wow, and that's just our state. Um, it, it speaks to something that I think will help uh, Laura evidenced it today, uh, Ruth and I evidenced in my own challenge some time ago, and that is if every person takes the time to look at their address and said, hey, I, who else is using my address as a registered voter? And come in here, we can get out of the business of sending a letter because that's time consuming, it's costly, it does raise occasionally a question about whether this piece of information is, is truly valid or not. Uh, and if, if, if we go to something like that, where really it promotes individual responsibility uh, uh, here on the voters, I think we would all applaud that. And it would not necessarily make your job easier because today you had to call in three challengers. Uh, if everyone shows up and has, let's say, 6,000 or so uh, come to challenge because there are people registered to their address who don't belong there, then you have a little bit different problem, and we certainly would respect that. I think the lesson we've learned here is the timing of this kind of activity is important vis-a-vis well, -vis the other stuff that you've got on your plate. That's what I was saying. If some of the efforts are moved towards changing the law, it would make it easier on everybody yeah. and more cost-effective for Absolutely. Everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. So, thank you. And thank I'd like you. to sort of put this before the board and, and see if we want Beverly to kind of put this in writing and, and make a resolution. Because it sounds like that that is a better answer to the problem, is to lobby for the law change. And so if our board agrees that, you know, the law, you know, it's just a, it's kind of a formality thing. But well, would, you're making a motion that, that Beverly yeah. put in writing for a suggestion for a change in the law? Uh, 
Why don't we make that in the form of a suggestion to Beverly that she present to us at okay. a, at a All right. that future, good. future then, meeting? Right. Okay. They have enough on their plate now. Yeah, well, to yeah, no, not. For. I've actually already presented it to Don Wright and Veronica, and I can just ask them if there's been any update on it. Well, yeah. But I think, too, it would. Yeah. Well, I would I'll like to sign board, something like that. I don't know if there's any update in regard to that, because it might help in the future processes. Well, all right. Your motion is you suggest she puts this in writing? Yeah, okay, so I'll change the motion. To Which is? Ask her to put that in writing and, and present it to us with the intention that I would move at that time after review to put it into a resolution form for the board to sign. Okay. Second? At that time. Uh, yes. Okay, I agree with that. We'll do it. Yes, ma'am. I would ask that when that's in writing, that somehow we would get it also because then we could forward that to people that we're working with, perhaps, you know, coming at it from two different positions might be helpful because I agree with you that that seems like it should eliminate a great this is all public information, but we'll try and take that extra step to make sure the public information gets to people who are more interested. Well, I'll our minutes. Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you going to increase my cost? <laughs> <laughs> I heard. Yeah, we'll get it. All right. One second. Ms. Miller, hold it, everybody. Ms. Miller, you had a. She wants a copy also. Okay. Uh, is there any other. Uh, subject or comment or question from the board, from the staff, or from our friends in the audience to the benefit of what we're trying to do here um, today? I do have something I, I want to sort of roll around. You know, we do have, these were the challenges that were um, dismissed uh, because they voted in 2012. So we want to give them a chance to see if there's moved in the county and, and be able to vote. But what I'm thinking is, because these letters came back, can we direct or ask the, the, the board to send out the mailing? Excuse me? We will send a notice of hearing to these to this same address. Right, but these were these were these were dismissed because they voted in 2012, oh. so we're not dealing. But my thought is that after after the election, because it's, this is proof that they're not there. I don't and if they don't vote in the election, I'm wondering, can we go ahead and I don't think as a board more? and a government agency, we can target a certain area of people to just write them a letter and say, hey, do you still live there? If not, we're going to remove you. That's, almost, that's like a challenge. I don't think the board, we can check with the state board, but I've, mm -hmm. I've never heard any such. Well, I'm just, because we're real this is telling me they're probably not there. But they could be in the county and they could vote this True. year. But if they don't, I'm thinking the more but likely they, they could. Like Cliff says, are we going to target the other 5,780 that are also inactive and send them a letter? That's the, that's the um, conundrum. Well, it wouldn't be we all the inactive because these, these people aren't inactive. They, they, well, that's my point, though. They we're, voted in 2012. We're just targeting these people and not other groups. What about of everybody voters? else who hasn't reported their move? Yeah. Every, you know, Anybody that's inactive that you know we've had mailings back from? Well, I wasn't. I we just have to be real that. careful yeah. about because uh, these are targeting active voters. Anybody, as far as saying we're going to remove them, you know, return unless there's a law that says we can do that. You know, and of course the law that the federal and state have set up is the list maintenance program. As we all right. know, and it's been proven, there's some of them that falls through the crack for whatever reason. All right. Any other comments or questions? Okay. I think we've covered it as well as we know how. I thank you again for being caring citizens. Thank the board and the staff. Are we ready for a motion to adjourn? So. Second. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>